News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Nana Queer, weekends from 3 p.m. Should we put tobacco star warnings on ultra processed foods? Boris Johnson is calling on the government to do this. In this Daily Mail column, the former Prime Minister says that people don't know what they're feeding their families and there's too many extra ingredients. That's why I'm asking, should we put tobacco star warnings on ultra processed food? Well, joining me now to discuss Steve Miller, former presenter of Fat Families, Helena Davidson, campaigner and policy expert at the Vegan Society. Right, so I'm going to start with you, Steve Miller. What do you think? Oh, I'm applauding Boris today. Good on you, mate. Uh, and the reason for that is we know that the research on uh, cigarette, you know, the warnings on cigarettes, I should say, when those warnings were visual, they worked very well. The second reason on a practical level is that we need to start stop looking and listening before we start, you know, grazing and putting mm. things in the trolley. And the third thing is that you know, these kind of signs or these warnings, I should say, are kind of hypnotic. They trigger the emotion. So they're much more likely to get people to think and, and maybe resist. Yeah, so the, at the Vegan Society, we're broadly in favour of increasing consumer knowledge um, when it comes to the nutrition, nutritional value of people's food. Um, but I think it's important to mention that ultra processed food isn't an issue that's exclusive to vegans. And whilst most meat alternatives will fall into the ultra processed food category, it largely depends on how we're going to look at how UPFs are going to be assessed because vegan um, alternatives that are fall under ultra processed foods, they're actually on average healthier than meat products or ultra processed foods that contain animal products. Really? So I think it depends on how we look at it. We might have to take a closer look at the nutritional profile of individual foods rather than the level of processing. Good morning, 9.30 on Wednesday, the 20th of March. This is Britain's News on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. Very good morning. So, Kate's security breach this morning, shocking claims that unauthorised staff at the London Clinic attempted to access the Princess of Wales' private medical records. Who are they? What do they know? And have they been sacked? A potentially very serious breach of private medical records, but what is the consequence for Kensington Palace and, indeed, the London Clinic? More details shortly. You. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. Pay up or you're on your own. In GB News exclusive interview, the former and potentially next president of the United States, Donald Trump, told Nigel Farage he would not protect NATO countries if they don't pay their way. And breaking this morning, inflation plummets to its lowest level for more than two years. Will the Bank of England now be forced to cut interest rates? Inflation has indeed fallen from 4% during the year to January to 3.4% in February. Prices are still rising, but the cost of living crisis for some is easing. And is vaping linked to cancer? The first potential link between e-cigarettes and the disease is revealed today. But what are the risks? And is it a time on a, for a ban on the so-called safer smoking alternative? And breaking in only the last few moments, Greg's is in chaos. Some stores have been forced to shut this morning over IT issues. This is just days, of course, after Sainsbury's, Tesco's and McDonald's suffered their own digital meltdowns. And royal kidnap plot, a young princess, a gunman and a bodyguard shot three times. Today we look back at the thwarted plan to abduct Princess Anne and we meet the man who took the bullets to protect her. I've never seen that photograph before of Princess Anne at the bedside. Yeah, and she then she then went on panorama. It was an extraordinary moment because the car was heading to, to Buckingham Palace. A mad gunman mm. gets the door open. She's in the back seat. The protection officer, who we're talking to later, took three bullets for it. Amazing. And of course, it was the time before mobile phones. There's no footage of it, but no. we will hear from the man himself 50 years on from that incident. So get in touch with us this morning, GBviews at gbnews.com with all of your thoughts. But first, here is the news with Sophia Wensler. Thanks, 
Bev. Good morning. It's 9.32. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your headlines. UK inflation has fallen more than expected to the lowest level in two years. Official figures show UK inflation from February came in at 3.4%, down from 4%. Economists have forecasted that the Office for National Statistics figure would fall to 3.5%. Inflation is now closer to the Bank of England's 2% target and comes ahead of the latest interest rate decision tomorrow. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says it's good news for families. This is the lowest headline rate for two and a half years, but most encouragingly food inflation, which was nearly 20% a year ago, is now just 5%. And what this shows is that the plan to bring inflation down, it was over 11% when Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, uh, now just 3.4%. That plan is working, but we do need to stick to it and see it right the way through. Housing asylum seekers on barges, military bases and student digs will cost taxpayers more than hotels currently being used. The National Audit Office said housing those waiting for asylum decisions in alternative accommodation, such as a Bibby Stockholm barge and former RAF sites, would cost the Home Office £1.2 billion. That's £46 million more than using hotels and B&Bs. And while £230 million is expected to have been spent on developing four alternative sites by the end of the month, only two have opened so far and with reduced capacity. An investigation has reportedly been launched at the London Clinic over claims staff tried to access the Princess of Wales's private medical records. The Mirror has reported that at least one member of staff tried to access Catherine's notes while she was a patient at the private hospital in central London in January. Princess Catherine was admitted to the hospital for abdominal surgery in January and has not attended a public engagement since. The UK Privacy and Data Protection Watchdog said it had received a breach report. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Andrew and Bev. Good morning, it's 9.35. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. We are the lucky ones. Yes. We got our Greggs this morning, but there's been a massive IT meltdown at Greggs. I'm very suspicious about it. <laughs> it's not that you're suspicious about I know. these things. I like to see you getting a little bit more sceptical. Bev sees a conspiracy where I don't. Ah. I see cock up. But, I don't think um, it's not a conspiracy, is, it's but, super sceptical thinking. But this is, this is McDonald's, Sainsbury's, um, Tesco, all within 24 hours of each other. Well, we've got a sausage roll here for you. Oh. There we go. Look. Oh, delicious. Andrew <laughs> is literally <laughs> recoiling. This is breakfast. I don't mind eating my Greggs on TV. Right. Mmm. Mmm. No one else is getting it, just me. Sorry, viewers at home, listeners, if you... Let me tell you, she never shares. <laughs> While she's eating, there is a very major story going on, and the, um, we're not sure if the police are involved yet, but the London Clinic, where the Princess of Wales was treated, mm. there is a major security scare because hospital bosses looking, it's in the front page of the Daily Mirror today, that a member of staff, or more than one, was caught trying to access her own private medical records. It's very serious, this, because senior hospital bosses have spoken to Kensington Palace about the potential breach, and they claim, they say, we firmly believe that all all our patients, no matter their status, deserve total privacy and confidentiality regarding their medical information, well, which is true. But the worry for me is, so was this idle curiosity by a member of staff, dinner party gossip? Everybody is talking about what's wrong with the Princess of Wales. Uh, maybe it was, a, we don't know if it was a doctor, we don't know who it was. Or were they much more nefariously mm. thinking, if I can access these records, I can sell them. Well, good luck, because there'd be no media outlets in this country would touch them with a barge pole, but go abroad, yeah. there would be plenty of bidders and it would be go to the highest bidder, and that I, would be really appalling. It would. I, I'd heard about this over the weekend, actually. I'd heard that this had happened in the hospital, so my understanding was that there was a message sent on the intranet of the hospital to say that they were aware, the management of the hospital, that people had been trying to access Kate's medical records. And that was unprecedented, particularly in a hospital like that, which uh, the London Clinic, which 
often looks after the royals, pretty much routinely looks mm. after the royals. Yeah, that's, yeah. Where, that's where they go for any kind of health issues. Um, they have their babies at the Linda Wing at, pa at St Mary's, but they, they go there to be treated. So a really serious breach. Who was it? Why, as you say? What did they hope to achieve by And, and, and for, 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 for the Princess Wales in particular, very difficult, because if you remember, when she had very bad morning sickness back in 2012, she mm. was at the Edward VII, um, those two pranksters called in from Australia, yeah. from Australian radio station, posed as the Queen and Prince Philip. The nurse somehow put them through. Yeah. They were then broadcasting details of Kate's I've health symptoms. That. But the worst part about it was the nurse hanged herself. Oh, no! She did. She hanged herself, and that was profoundly traumatic for both Kate and William. Oh, that's awful. Terrible. Well, let's bring in Cameron. Our Royal Correspondent, Cameron Walker, uh, joins us now. Good morning, um, Cameron. Good morning. You and I were discussing this here in, in the uh, office on Monday morning, weren't we, that we'd heard this rumour about the fact that there were doctors trying to seek out these medical records. Um, it's a serious breach of confidentiality. It certainly is, and me and a number of my journalist colleagues have been trying to contact the London Clinic this morning. As yet, they have not responded, apart from the statements they sent to the Mirror last night, which said, we firmly believe that all our patients, no matter their status, deserve total privacy and confidentiality. But since then, we've had a number of other statements from, mm. from various people, including the Health Minister, Maria Caulfield, this morning, who says the police, Metropolitan Police, have been asked to look into this because a data breach of this kind mm is potentially a very serious criminal yeah. offence. You cannot access someone's private medical details. Whether you're the Princess of Wales or whether you're y Joe Soap. Yeah, exactly. No matter who you are, your private medical details are private. So unless you've got consent of the patients, in this instance, Princess of Wales, or, and consent of the hospital, you should not be accessing these records. So, i.e., unless you're a doctor or a nurse actually actively involved in the treatment of the princess, they should not have access to these records. Mm. So it could, become, could potentially become quite nasty, this. I'm glad that this issue is being raised, of course, because we, we talk all the time, don't we, about um, how the NHS is moving to a very data-driven system and that, that I think it's really crucial that we have a reminder that our personal... For yeah, all yeah. of everybody, our personal medical records should be completely confidential. Um, and... I, um, I, I imagine that we'll, we'll hopefully get a statement from the hospital, I would have thought, because it can't be that difficult to track this person down. Well, fingers crossed. Kensington Palace uh, spoke to me last night and said it is very much a matter for the London Clinic, so they are bat batting the spotlight mm. onto them. The Information Commissioner has also released a statement saying that we can confirm that we have received a breach report um, and are assessing the information provided, which suggests to me the report in the mirror is accurate. I suspect what's going on right now in the London Clinic is they are as we spoke about, mm. uh, trying to work out exactly how serious this breach is, how many members of staff have looked at the information, mm. if indeed they were successful in accessing it, because they may well have tried and failed, but the, the, act, the trying would have been picked you up. You think in the olden days, what a silly expression, but you know what I mean, it would have mm. been a filing cabinet, but of course now everything will be backed mm. up on computer. Yeah. Uh, so there could presumably be not that many people, Cameron, who could access this sort of material. Yeah, and the London Clinic is a very prestigious hospital. Yeah. It will have encryption after encryption after password yeah. after password. It will be incredibly difficult yeah. to access, mm. particularly the Princess of Wales, who yeah. is the future queen, But uh, each, medical details. You would think that each medic has their own login and that login will be identifiable. So I imagine there are a lot of people right the, now being quite the, nervous. The police should be, be involved. Yep, Please more on this uh, as we go throughout the morning. But next, the former US President Donald Trump sat down with Nigel Farage last night in a world exclusive. It broadcast on GB News yesterday evening. It was a wide-ranging discussion. But uh, it's his thoughts on Prince Harry and whether he would uh, defend NATO that caught the most attention. One of our recent exports to you uh, is Prince Harry. No one knows the truth. What did he put on his American visa form. If they know something about the drugs and if he lied, they'll have to take appropriate action. Now, the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. We're not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. Our country's gone to hell, and it's gone to hell fast. November 5th is going to be the most important day in the history of our country. I thought, hell. I have to say, I thought it was quite nice to see old Donald Trump, not old, as in Joe Biden old, but familiar to us, fighting talk, being himself. He's, he's all about the deal, isn't he? He's all about the money. That's the bit that I found was uh, interesting. And no confusion, no suggestion of any confusion yeah. at all, whereas Joe Biden 
I said yesterday, talk, you can do five hours, and that's your lot. Quite a difference. We're well, joining us now as Professor of US Politics at University College Dublin, Scott Lucas. Scott, good morning, good to see you again. What did you make of the interview? Well, it wasn't an interview. It was one politician, Mr. Farage, handing over your channel for 25 minutes to another politician, Mr. Trump, for whom he has worked and whom he might be working for this year so that Trump could put out his posturing, his insult, his misinformation, and yes, at many points, his lies. Uh, there were many issues that weren't discussed, and the issues that were discussed from NATO to immigration were marked by a series of falsehoods. It was good from, in terms of NATO, though, to have some clarification yeah. on that going forward. I think he was very straightforward about that, Scott. The problem with the answer on NATO is, is that even as Trump rode back his comment last month, where he effectively invited Russia to attack America's NATO allies, is that he set it up with a series of false statements. So, for example, he uh, did not, he did threaten to withdraw the United States from NATO in 2020. I know one of the people who was in that meeting, uh, the Irish commissioner to the EU, Phil Hogan, another commissioner to the EU, Thierry Breton, has also testified to that. So I know people who were in that conversation, and Trump lied, that he, in fact, had never made that threat while he was president. He also uh, put up the misinformation that because of his threats, such as inviting Russia to come in and attack NATO's allies, that was why NATO uh, countries have increased spending. That is false. Uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, uh, said last month that there's an unprecedented increase in spending on defense by NATO members last year in 2023, where 18 of 31 uh, NATO countries at that time we're now meeting their target. But Trump actually again lied that Stoltenberg told him that he was the reason why the NATO countries had increased their spending. Is, is he sounding to you... I mean, I'm, I appreciate um, you're no fan of the uh, former president of the United States, Scott, to put it mildly, but is he sounding more presidential to you than Joe Biden? Who's it's, not a question of being a, it's not a question of being a fan of uh, well, Donald Trump. Well, you're not Trump. a fan. It's, it's, no, it's, it's being a fan of the facts, and it's being a fan of realistic, sensible discussion of the issues, rather than giving someone a free campaign advertisement for 25 minutes. Uh, he, of course, gave out many of his scripted answers uh, that were set up beforehand. The interview was edited uh, to make sure that there were no glitches in it. So yes, Donald Trump was on safe territory to say whatever he wanted to with Nigel Farage nodding, and, you know, if you constitute that, a softball discussion, uh, a campaign advertisement of being presidential, so be it. OK. All right. Thank you, Scott. Scott Lucas, always like your very frank opinions. That's what we do here on GB News. If you didn't see the interview, you can, of course, see it on the GB News app. I Up next. It. And GBNews.com, of course. Um, up next, we're gonna, we've been told for ages, haven't we, that vaping is safer than smoking. Well, a new study, surprise, surprise, says that it isn't. We'll have someone on next to still try and defend vapes. You're with Britain's Newsroom on GBNews. Dubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Get this right, we all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful, but what do we do about it? Because now uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse, that is the campaign? There's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, of course, oh. you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they've committed a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. 
London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to a conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, because I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay. They show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be. There should be a penalty for that. Oh, for the same you. reason, if you're you com- obliged to, use if you it. commit, there's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is no. But there is an offer because at there the end of the day, like you, earn it, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no, solution. no, it's easy. If you it's see, that's easy, an impossible solution. They've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at nine thirty, when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Well, and some very good news for everybody. Inflation has plummeted this morning, falling to 3.4% in February from 4% in January, which is much more than expected. So joining us now is our business economics editor, Liam Halligan, to celebrate this glorious news. How good is it? It is good news, but let's be clear, prices are still rising, but yeah. they're just rising at a slower pace. So during the year to January... Prices, the CPI, the index of all prices of goods and services, was up 4%. During the year to February, it was up 3.4%. This is sharply down at the height of the cost of living crisis. At the end of 2022, inflation was 11%. Mm. So now it's 3.4%, but it's still way above the Bank of England's 2% target. A lot of people will think, I don't see any easing of the cost of living crisis. The fine print, which we can talk about, shows that food prices are down, uh, fuel prices are down. Um, But still, a lot of people are squeezed, and I don't think this is enough for now for the Bank of England to lower interest rates when it meets tomorrow. I think interest rates are going to stay at five and a quarter percent, at least for now. What will it take to get interest rates down? Well, I think the Bank of England will want to see inflation uh, much closer to the Bank of England's two percent target. Mm. Um, That's where we are. But there are good... There is good news in some of these figures. I'll be doing a full one of my... On the money video wall specials in the next hour. So With some graphics. Brace yourself, plenty of graphics. <laughs> we like um, graphics higher, right? lower. It's like the price is right, isn't it, for, for, for economics nerds? But look, food price inflation is now at 4.5%. This time last year, it was at 19%, yeah. a 45 year high. Yeah. Again, prices are going up, but a lot more slowly than they were. Petrol and diesel prices are actually down compared to February last year. Mm. Petrol's about 4% cheaper than last February last year, and diesel is about 11% cheaper than February Isn't last year. Going back up Even though in the last few weeks it started exactly. to go up. Why? Because the oil price is surging, and this is the big problem, this geopolitics. And this is what we're going to talk about with you in the next hour, when you come back with your big graphic and your video wall. Oh, yeah, I'll be there. Right, uh, we've got to move on. A shocking new study says that vaping might be linked to cancer. Not that shocking. It found e-cigarettes can cause similar DNA changes to cells of smoking, leading experts to claim that vaping does not seem as harmless as originally billed. So joining us now is Robert Sidebottom from the UK Vaping Industry Association. Good morning, Robert. Um, is this terrible news for your industry? I imagine you're going to try and defend uh, the product still and say that there's still a lot more research to be done. 
well, I don't need to really defend the product because I think actually if you read the article and you read the detail in the article, I mean, it actually starts and it states with, while this doesn't mean that vaping has the same degree of cancer risks as, as smoking does, it implies that vaping may have negative health impacts. However, we've, we've never said that vaping is completely risk-free, and we've always said that it is 95% safer than smoking, which it is. Um, and I think that but this... Hang on, Robert, can we just stop you there? How do you know it's 95% safer than smoking? Well, it's been uh, examined and it's been looked at. Um, and Cancer Research UK, for example, have reviewed that. And it's never been claimed as completely risk-free, but a comprehensive research has continually shown, um, first by Public Health England and then by the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, that vaping is 95% less harmful than smoking. And that's, a, you know, that's an ongoing fact. And what we've got to remember is that there is a substantial amount of harmful toxic chemicals in smoking. And that substantial amount of harmful toxic chemicals, um, 70 of which, which we know cause cancer, is responsible for seven in 10 lung cancers in the UK. And that cannot be applied to vaping at all. It's just unreasonable to do that. And it's about having a longer term understanding there. We've had cigarettes for how long? Decades. How long, Robert, have we known about, or have we had vaping being used on a wide scale? How many years? What, less than 20? Well, I would say around about 20 years. Before it was regulated, it was being used quite widely as well. And, um, you know, it, it, it's... We accept that further research needs to be done. And actually, we welcome studies into the health impact of vaping, as we want to give every former smoker the full confidence that vaping is considerably safer than smoking. And that's, it, that's the important message. But that's about the former smokers. What about the young people who are taking up vaping, Robert? It's better, they, not to vape. it's better not to vape at all. And we know why they take up smoking, because you lure them into your shops with silly flavours called bubblegum. Well, we can get into the flavour debate. That's no problem at all because, you know, adults like flavours. I, you know, particularly I like squashy sweets. Um, and just because they're a squashy seat and they're multicoloured doesn't mean to say that adults can't have flavours. And we can get into that. But these products, and let's be absolutely clear, are not for children. They are an age-gated mm. product that are for adults only. And, and that is exactly who they should be and sold hopefully, to. Um, I'm so sorry, Rob, we've run out of time, but and hopefully oh. this research will show that they certainly are not for children. And I, for one, will be shouting that from the rooftops as long as I can. Don't go anywhere. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. A bit of a drab start for most of us today. Dull and damp. The brightest skies are going to be across Northern Ireland and Western Scotland, where we should see some lengthy spells of sunshine. Elsewhere, sunshine in short supply. Generally dry and fine across the southeast. It may cheer up here, but a damp start for eastern Scotland, southern Scotland. The rain will tend to ease here through the day, but it stays uh, pretty dank across northern England, particularly Yorkshire, parts of North Wales. The rain on and off, but fairly low. Light. To the south of that, mostly dry and still pretty mild. 18 Celsius is possible with a bit of sunshine. Some sunnier skies across the northwest. A, a cooler day here with a, a fresher feel in the cooler air, but still plenty of sunshine, feeling pleasant enough. The rain and drizzle will trickle away from eastern parts of England through this evening. Much of uh, the UK will become dry by midnight. But then after midnight, more rain comes into the far northwest. The wind's picking up here as well. Quite a bit of cloud around. Could see some mist and fog where we keep some clearer skies. Temperatures may in rural spots get close to freezing. On to Thursday then, and generally a dry, fine day for England and Wales. A brighter day, certainly to the east of the Pennines compared to today. Still a fair bit of cloud elsewhere, but some bright or sunny spells in the south. Outbreaks of rain will move in across Scotland and Northern Ireland through the day, so a, a blustery and a fairly wet day here. Rain on and off throughout. Again, fairly mild for most of us, with temperatures generally in the teens. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is
is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Mark Dolan tonight. Weekends from 9pm. I've personally been very torn on whether Prince Harry should have full police protection when he's in the United Kingdom. On the one hand, why should taxpayers fork out for somebody that's left the country and the institution? He is no longer a working, serving royal. But I don't think it matters. He is one of the most famous men in the world, and whether he's a royal or not, he is an ambassador for this country. And he still does good. Charitable causes, the Invictus Games, and he is still a nice and charming guy with a heart. And whilst he has left the royal family and departed these shores, he was and remains the son of King Charles. That is a biological fact. Well, let's hope so. And it wasn't his choice to be born into royalty. It wasn't his choice to be the son of the king. And for that reason, I think he should have equal police protection to his brother William when he is in this country. He couldn't be a more high-profile figure. And unfortunately, like all the royals, Harry will be a target for some very bad people. I fear that if, God forbid, anything happened to him or his family, the authorities would have blood on their hands. So, it's not often that I back Prince Harry, but on this one, he has my support. Look what happened to his poor mum, killed in a Paris tunnel in the 1990s with an allegedly drunk chauffeur. A top royal security insider recently told me that Diana would still be with us today if she had had top royal protection at that time. So let's not make the same mistake twice. Prince Harry needs full protection and the best we've got. Yes, he might be a numpty, but he's our numpty. It's 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 20th of March. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News with me, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. Major security breach for the Princess of Wales this morning. Shocking claims that unauthorised staff at the London Clinic tried to assess her private medical records. Who are they? What do they know? And have they been sacked? A potentially very serious breach of the Princess of Wales' private medical information. But what are the consequences for the hospital and Kensington Palace? Find out shortly. Defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. Pay up or you're on your own in GB News' exclusive interview. The former and potentially next president of the United States, Donald Trump, told Nigel that he would not protect NATO countries if they didn't pay their way. And is vaping linked to cancer? The first potential link between e-cigarettes and the disease is revealed today. How bad are the risks? And is it time for a ban on the so-called safer smoking alternative? And Greg's is in chaos this morning. Some stores have been forced to shut over IT issues just days after Sainsbury's, Tesco's and McDonald's suffered their own digital meltdowns. And the royal kidnap plot. 50 years ago, a young princess, a gunman and a bodyguard, he was shot three times. Today we look back at the thwarted plan to abduct Princess Anne and we meet the man who took those three bullets to protect her, James Beaton. And Taxman is not available. HMRC is introducing an annual summer break on its phone lines to push customers to go, guess what, online. Is this going to affect you?
Oh, it's lovely doing your tax return, isn't it? It's already always a highlight of your year. Now, if you've got to contact the HMRC, you're going to be talking to a chatbot. Well, good luck getting through if you can, because they don't answer the phone. That's mm. already the criticism. And now, in the summer, you won't be able to speak to anybody at all. Yeah, I... I, I you should explain to me what a chatbot is. A chatbot means uh, you type a little question and then an AI robot will answer your question. But if your question does not fit into a very narrow definition of boxes and questions and answers, Hard you aren't going to get your question answered. And remember, if you, tax, if you pay your tax bill late, they charge you interest from the first day. Yeah, and you won't be able to blame the system because there'll be nobody to complain to. No. Welcome to the dystopian future. GBviews at GBnews.com is the email to let us know your thoughts this morning. First, though, your very latest news with Sophia Wensler. Thanks, Bev. Good morning. It's 10 o'clock. I'm Sophia Wansler in the GB Newsroom. Your top story. UK inflation has fallen more than expected to the lowest level in over two years. Official figures show UK inflation for February came in at 3.4%, down from 4%. Economists had forecast the Office for National Statistics figure would fall to 3.5%. Inflation is now closer to the Bank of England's 2% target and comes ahead of the latest interest rate decision on Thursday. This is the lowest headline rate for two and a half years, but most encouragingly, food inflation, which was nearly 20% a year ago, is now just 5%. And what this shows is that the plan to bring inflation down, it was over 11% when Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, uh, now just 3.4%. That plan is working, but we do need to stick to it and see it right the way through. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, speaking there. Now, Shadow Business and Trade Secretary Jonathan Reynolds welcomed the drop, but said we still need to see inflation coming down further. Where I would direct my criticism would be towards the government, because as Liam Halligan correctly identified, if you look at some of the reasons we've been so uniquely exposed to high inflation, well, exposure to high fossil fuel prices, the government doubling down on that rather than finding alternatives, um, a lot of people not back in the labour market after the pandemic because they're waiting for NHS treatment, that's the responsibility of the government. I think even looking at the, the way the agreement with the European Union was done, where we've got a lot of friction still in terms of food prices and how food and agri-products are transported between here and the European Union, those are the things I think the government should have, have looked at and been a much greater priority. Housing asylum seekers on barges, military bases and student digs will cost taxpayers more than the hotels currently being used. The National Audit Office said housing those waiting for asylum decisions in alternative accommodation, such as the Bibby Stockholm barge and former RAF sites, would cost the Home Office £1.2 billion. That's £46 million more than using hotels and B&Bs. And while £230 million is expected to have been spent on developing four alternative sites by the end of the month, only two have opened so far and at reduced capacity. The Prime Minister's flagship Rwanda policy faces another parliamentary showdown as the Lords considers whether to hold the legislation up until Easter. MPs overturned ten changes made by peers when the bill was in the Commons on Monday. The House of Lords could dash efforts to get the legislation through Parliament by Easter if they make fresh changes to the safety of Rwanda bill today. The Home Secretary, James Cleverley, is urging the unelected chamber to let his bill pass. An investigation has been launched at the London Clinic over claims staff tried to access the Princess of Wales medical records. The Mirror has reported that at least one member of staff tried to access Catherine's notes while she was a patient at the private hospital in central London in January. Princess Catherine has been admitted to the hospital for abdominal surgery in January and has not attended a public engagement since then. The UK Privacy and Data Protection Watchdog said it had received a breach of the reports. Some Greg stores have been forced to close after being hit by an IT glitch at the Tills. Some outlets have been forced to put temporary closed notices on their doors, whilst others asked customers to place orders outside using the Greg's mobile app before food could be given to them. A Greg spokesperson said it's working hard to resolve the issue. The government's aim to create a smoke-free generation is one step closer today as the tobacco and vapes bill is introduced to the House of Commons. Under the new bill, anyone turning 15 this year or younger will never legally be sold cigarettes. Government figures show that smoking costs the UK around £17 billion a year. If the bill passes, ministers say smoking rates among those 14 to 30 could be nearly zero by 2040.
Under Secretary of State for Mental Health and Women's Health Maria Caulfield says the bill will also tackle youth vaping. It's already illegal to sell nicotine-based vaping products to children, but there is a loophole and, and uh, manufacturers have created flavoured vapes instead which don't have nicotine, but we don't necessarily know the safety profile of those vapes either. So in the legislation, it, we will close that loophole and so any vaping product will no longer be able to be sold to a child. Flavoured products, the way they're sold, the packaging, where they're displayed in shops. Because you're right, we don't want children to start on a path of vaping. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Andrew and Bev. Very good morning, 10.07. I've had, my, uh, I've had my sausage roll. He's a bit posher than me. He likes a pan au chocolat. So we have them. We're not just promoting Greg's mindlessly this morning. Coincidentally, the products are being handed out free <laughs> in our building. We can't buy them because because the tills are down because of an IT failure, and I'm convinced it's a it's a cons no. I'm not going to use the word conspiracy. I've got I've got crumbs everywhere yeah. now. Honestly, Andrew Pierce. We have Cameron Walker in the studio with us. Our very uh, work, hard working royal correspondent, and Madeleine Grant from the Telegraph columnist. Madeleine, let's Good talk morning. to you first of all. The, the Princess of Wales. This is a pretty egregious breach, attempted breach anyway of her privacy. It really is. It's very depressing. I mean, you can only assume that someone at the clinic must have thought, I mean, probably rightly in my opinion, that there are people that would pay very handsomely for this yeah. information. So they they've would. decided to... in this to... country. No, No exactly. publication would touch it, but go to America. Oh, my goodness, yes. Where things, I think that the some of the coverage, but also the, the social media speculation has been pretty mm. kind of gutter-based mm. stuff, hasn't it? I mean, I've been really shocked and quite sort of depressed by the discourse around essentially a, a planned and... Um, quite, you know, fairly openly discussed medical operation and stepping back from the mm. public sphere. And people have genuinely gone mad about this. I mean, when you say people have gone mad, I mean, look at this. <laughs> the world goes mad after over a woman going shopping is the front page of The Star this morning, um, which kind of, I think, sums up largely the mood of the nation. Um, <laughs> this, this latest revelation, though, about her medical records yes. being... Um, it, it somehow attempted to be looked at by some medic within that hospital. Yeah. This will, I think, if for those people who maybe feel we need more from the princess, hopefully this will inspire a bit more sympathy to leave her alone. Mm. Even the medics are trying to yeah. find out what's wrong with her. I mean, even royals have... A, everyone has a right to privacy yeah. include about their, their yeah. private health matters, including royals. And, you know, Kate... Um, the, the, the Princess of Wales, she is obviously a future queen, but she's, it's not quite the same as the health of the monarch, which directly mm. affects the nation and the functioning of mm. the state. Mm. So I think that, you know, she does have a right to some privacy. But even, even when the queen was sick, they didn't tell us what was wrong with her. Not precisely, no. exactly. We yeah. heard afterwards no. that she had a form of bone cancer, yeah. but we were never told it at the time because she would have hated that. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that there is a real sense of entitlement. Ironically, it's often coming from people in America for whom it's not their monarchs, who know. seem to think, well, tell us what's going on, you know, we have so. a right well, to they, know. They think they own our royal family. <laughs> but, you know, it's a real generational issue, this as well, isn't it? We, there were, I would imagine, it's terrible, but I jumped to the conclusion this will be a young doctor in the hospital. who may assume it, it may not be a doctor. Correct, yeah. correct. But somebody within that setting, I presume they were a younger person. I can't imagine some of those uh, more more elderly doctors with an, uh, who understand the medical ethics would have tried to do this. The younger generation, Madeline, have a different relationship with privacy. Yeah. Nothing is private. They, they broadcast everything from their breakfast to the new bra they've just bought. You know, the younger generation. <laughs> there is no privacy. Is that what we're seeing here? Well, I've never quite... I've never quite understood that. It's definitely true. I've, I remember a few years ago, people began posting Instagram pictures of their dinner. Yeah. You think, well, even if it's a lovely How dinner... Is that? Not. Why, why? I mean, who cares? And Good now it's you. a job for some people. Yeah, but, I mean, I have no idea who did it. I suspect that there was probably... The motives were more mercenary. People wanted to get some kind of payment yeah. for this. Yeah, well, and, of course, the video of the, K of, of the princess and the prince at the Windsor farm shop worldwide audience it's been every country yeah. in the western world has been f running that because that still is mm. the enduring interest it's in the British true. monarchy. It's true. And actually, perversely, even though a lot of the discourse is, is really like lowest common denominator stuff, it does weirdly show a kind of soft power that abides. Because I can't think of a time where even a politician yeah. around the world who actually 
is, you know, has real power in, in governing yeah. rather than symbolic power. The president of Ireland, I know, <laughs> whose name escapes at the moment, has had health issues, been in hospital. I don't think it's a talking point in Basildon. No, no, Nobody I don't think it is. It, where they're talking about. <laughs> Princess of Wales in Basel. They are. <laughs> and they're talking about her in Milwaukee. But this is part, this is the internet as well. I mean, this is, um, social media creates a very fertile mm. ground for people to share conspiracy theories. And I'm sure that it's not all sincere. You know, often this is in jest. But I think we also have a tendency to forget that what we joke about on social media does actually pertain to real life people. Yeah. Um, Cameron, let's bring you in here. Um, just to, if anybody's tuning in this morning, just, just recap for us, if you would, this story why it's on the front pages of some of the papers today. Yeah, of course. So the Princess of Wales went into the London Clinic to have her abdominal surgery. And what the Mirror reported last night, which appears to have now been confirmed by a number of different organisations, is that there is an alleged breach of the Princess of Wales's private medical information, i.e. at least one member of staff at the hospital attempted to access the Princess's private medical records. Now, the reason why that is so significant is because that is a potential very serious criminal offence. You cannot access someone's private medical information without A, their consent, and B, the hospital's kind of administrator uh, consent. So unless you're in di directly involved in the treatment, you should not have access uh, to it. Clearly, this is in the context of all the social media conspiracy theories that have been flying around the internet recently. You, uh, as you mentioned, this could just simply be a nosy receptionist. Mm. It could also be something more sinister and someone trying to sell that information on mm. uh, to somebody, uh, to a foreign press. But you mentioned social media and the dangers of it. I, I refer to The Sun here. This is now the third time this week this yeah. story has been on the front page because they yeah. keep having to justify that this is a true story mm. because of the social media speculation and trolls. people are saying it's not her. There is such it's a, a exactly, a look-alike, a body double, you name it, has been on the internet. Yeah. But and what's the all harm of this in is that, though? Because it's translating into mainstream media. And my WhatsApp, for example, I, I've lost count the amount of people over the last few weeks who have asked me if the conspiracy theories around the Princess of Wales is true. They appear online to be mistrusting the information mm. that... We, we, as the media, the verified media, are giving, and <coughs> indeed the palaces, because of all these online conspiracies. Well, theories. this... Um, I would yeah. say, did the photograph make the... Cons pr probably promoted... The, the photograph yeah. which they edited... The Photoshop one, yeah. That probably pr promoted even more conspiracy theories, Cameron. Yeah, it certainly didn't help themselves. But my, my worry a little bit with this is that this is going to all nudge us towards a place in which the internet is more regulated, less no, free you speech... Can. You, it, can you? Well, this is what the Online Safety Act is trying to do, isn't it? And, you know, the legislation around... Uh, intolerance or free hate speech. My concern is that's where this goes. So I'm not a fan of the wild speculation. What it's proven to me is that some people really need to write novels yeah. because some <laughs> of the plots which have been stitched around her I existence you know would be made brilliant ITV dramas. I, I must be one of the few. I haven't bothered to read any of it because I just can't be bothered, because <laughs> I know I've been told some of this. I just don't feel I need to read it. No. <laughs> I can't I scroll through it's... TikTok at the moment without them being another wild conspiracy really? theory. Really? No. Yeah. Right, I'm, Madeline, I'm, yeah, well, Cameron. Pa pa perhaps I should go on TikTok a bit. <laughs> Thank you so much for now. Uh, still to come, if you thought the BBC was a safe haven from adverts, oh. well, find out which classic radio drama is going to introduce them. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7pm. Our first question comes from Elliot. Elliot, hello. Is, is Canada now an authoritarian state? Elliot, I think it's been an authoritarian state for a while. I mean, uh, under Trudeau, this is a new thing now, and this is coming from the Justice Minister, uh, who has Arif Virani, and he has defended this new power for their online harms bill. That sounds familiar. We've got something quite similar. And they're saying they can now impose house arrest on someone who they think might commit a hate crime in the future, right? That's scary stuff, isn't it? There's obviously a very dark side to this, because you can't, or you sh in my opinion, you shouldn't be able to imprison somebody before they've done anything. Right. Well, it is Canada. Well. And, <laughs> and uh, I know you, you in this country, you kind of kind of respect Canada as a country. America didn't even know it was a country until recently. <laughs> and I think that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to, to show themselves to be different than America. I think America has a responsibility to, to invade. Uh, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I do. You know, you're, you're kidding, but it may come down to this. It's, or this may just be a, a 
Yeah, maybe. Well, I just think it's ridiculous that the idea yeah. of arresting someone... I mean, our government's yeah. bad enough, and the Scottish government's out of control, the Irish government's right. out of control. They're all talking about... I mean, the Irish government's got a new hate crimes bill where they're talking about they can seize your phone if they suspect you might have some material that could potentially yeah. stir up hatred. I mean, for God's sake, what does that mean? Your phone's full of that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, well, <laughs> the government knows that. Yeah. But, um, but the, you're, you're right. But it has to do with the bigger picture, which is Canada has sucked itself in on the big team world. So, sorry, I'm going to say it. It's big team world. And what they're, what they're doing, this is not even a free speech issue. This is just about silencing uh, dissent well, against the Canadian government. It has nothing to do with openness and talk, whatever. It's like saying, we don't want these people to spread their you opinions. Know, opinions. Dangerous opinions. That's what speech codes and hate speech laws always do. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Ten eighteen. It was Britain's News and GB News. Andrew Pearce and Bertone. The noise is off on the side with Stephen Pound, who never knows when to stop talking. The former Labour MP. <laughs> they used to pay me to do that. And that's what we love about you. <laughs> yes, we do. And Mike Parry, the broadcaster, is with us too. Yeah. Right. The BBC cool. gets all of our taxpayers' money, and yeah. therefore it doesn't have to have adverts. Well, now it's having the best of both worlds, Steve, uh, Mike, because it's having adverts as well. It's this strange. is a, an utter outrage. It's an utter I, outrage. Because I, I do. Uh, yeah. Um, I used to work in Ireland quite a lot. You know, IRA and all that. RTE which is the Irish broadcaster, has always had adverts. So their charter started with adverts and they've had them and used to moan that, you know, we're not only do we have to pay a, uh, a licence fee in Ireland, we get yeah. the adverts as well. But the strict deal in this country was you pay your £159, yeah, yeah. I've just paid it, and you don't get interrupted with adverts. This is an outrage for two reasons. Firstly, it means the money they get from the licence fee, the BBC will now be able to waste more of that paying people millions of pounds who are not very good at their job, yeah. But the BBC think they should, because that's the way they think. But secondly, of course, it will suck commercial revenue out of the commercial I market. Agree. And the BBC has spent the last 10 years trying to close down local newspapers well, and they, local websites. And they've done, by, uh, and they've and done, they've it, done it. And by intruding on the commercial market. Yeah. The BBC are a public service broadcaster who should never have gone around opening local radio stations yeah. to compete, compete against BBC and, and Radio 1. Never. But also, Mike, the websites they opened destroyed local newspapers, uh, and so local councils now have no check on what they're doing because local newspapers have gone. That used to be my job on my first uh, local paper. I lived in the town hall. On the, on the Chester Chronicle, I spent three days a week in council committee there meetings of the full right. council, and it went on the front page if the council were going to put up parking charges yeah. by 12p. Now they get away with it because there is no coverage, newspapers can't exist, and it's largely because the BBC fund agree. these local websites which take all the advertising and give all the information to people for free. It's an outrage. Right, well, uh, the, can I just, before you start, let me tell you what the BBC says, just to put the counter-argument. The BBC yep. spokesman oh. has said, listeners will continue to hear BBC audio without ads on BBC Sounds, which is the app, but as many of our podcasts are available on commercial platforms like Apple and Spotify, where adverts are the norm, we look to carry them in some of our content to generate more revenue to support the BBC, yeah. licence fee payers, our suppliers and our rights holders. Do they have a right to do that, do you think? Of course, I mean, can you think of a sentence involving the words thin 
end and wedge. <laughs> <laughs> because the minute they have adverts on any one of the platforms, then quite well, this opens the door. But look, this is the, the last knockings of the national broadcaster as such. This is the end of the BBC, as we know. Definitely. Their one USP was that they don't have adverts. And, you know, I thought it was great. But, I mean, my first thought when I read this is it, the archers and Desert Island Disc. Again. So, you know, I mean, what would the trail finders would obviously advertise on Desert Island Disc. But we've well, got sort of stair lifts and, you know, sort of embarrassing things for older people. <laughs> well, I, I think... But, I mean, they may just be dipping, they're dipping their toe in here, aren't they, to test the reaction? Oh, they've yeah. they, they, they licked a finger and they held it up in the air to see which way the wind's blowing. Yeah. But you know and I know that the BBC is in dire, dire trouble. They're, they're losing, losing their audience, well, left, right and And it's not just big. the Ken Bruce thing. They're I mean, too big. Right. out of control. Well, you know, if you read this stuff, stuff about... Um, a behemoth. I mean, I mean, look, we all know, yeah. Stephen will know this, he's a big football fan, that the audiences for a game that's being shown on the BBC and ITV is always four times bigger on the BBC because there are no adverts at half time. Yeah, so yeah. people have got continuous viewing. That's what they built their whole broadcasting model on. Right. You can't suddenly now say, now we're running out of cash because, you know, giving six million to a very average TV presenter for not doing very much is sending us broke. But, but the, but I know, we'll milk the advertising but, market. It's but, an outrage. But the point is, there's a very, very serious point there, which is a little bit close to, to where we are at the moment. GB News has just been actually uh, excoriated by people saying that there's a confusion between people giving, you know, acting as MPs and acting um, as newsreaders. Mm. If the national broadcaster is actually advertising a particular product, it will be seen as a national very good endorsement point. of that product. That's right. Very now, good that is point. outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. And so the competitors against that particular product would have a very, very strong case. Mm. The BBC, if it's still seen as a national broadcaster, the one that you turn to in times of the death of the royal family or war or anything like that, if they're going to say, you know, go out and buy Bloggs' shoe polish, then that's going to be seen mm. as an endorsement. Yeah. And some people may be saying, OK, but look, yeah. let them put ad take advertising, but then fine, then get off our back and give up the licence. Well, that's give it up all together. Yeah. Yeah. Give it up all together. Yeah. Yeah. Some, of the, yeah. some of the broadcasting giants around the world have been quite silent about getting rid of the BBC in its present form for a lot of years on the basis that if the BBC became commercial, they are huge and yeah, they yeah. would suck worldwide. an awful lot... Of, worldwide, they'd suck an awful lot of advertising revenue out of the current commercial mm. stations. Yeah. Well, I can tell you what, they might have more viewers and listeners than us, but they do not have the loyalty that GB News viewers and listeners have to any brands that we advertise. Sure, they don't have more listeners at the moment. Love us. Um, well, quite, at the moment. Right, let's move on. HMRC is introducing an annual summer break on its phone line. Unbelievable. Yeah. This is, <laughs> this is for six months um, from April the 8th until September the 29th. That is not a summer break. No, no. That's half the year. No, but it used to be a house of commons. By annual. Yeah. 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 So the summer, by yeah. definition, is three yeah. months. This is six months. Yeah. What, is, is, what is really year. ridiculous and insulting and downright abusive about this is that they're saying, why are we doing it? To make life easier for people. Uh, yeah. now, no, the, easier for themselves. The other thing is, I actually had to ring up HMRC the other day. Good it was coming no, to, how yeah. did that take? Yeah. Well, no, I rang up, and the first thing they said is, how would you rate the quality of this? Because it was an AI thing. How would you rate the quality of this? And I said, you know, I haven't actually had the phone call yet. You know, but... How would you rate it? And they say, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. I don't flipping understand what you're saying either. Yeah, yeah. And, it's blunt, and so you end up having to pay for an accountant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Absurd. But look, yeah. what's happened is with, with, the, with the Tory increase in the tax bans, a lot of older people, and may I say I speak here for a large number of them, are now dragged in with this they fiscal are. drag it's into drag. And yeah. so we're facing the thought. And these are people we thought we'd finish with all that nonsense. Yes, because yes, your pension now is going to be taxed. I know, or, or taxed I know. For the first yeah. time, yeah. I know. So you'd like to know all about this it, is, wouldn't you? This is yeah. this March, Mike, yeah. towards this AI world. I don't feel there's yeah. anybody in a position of power saying, can we put the brakes on this? Yeah. So we've talked about it, if this is beneficial it, for it, the majority of people. To me, it's a march to the world of idleness. Do you remember uh, yeah, it was revealed just two weeks ago that when Heathrow closed down last summer, one of the reasons it closed down was because all the scientific engineers who work on Heathrow... They're working from home. The nearest one was 90 minutes away. Yeah, yeah. So, so there was a glitch in the computers. If they'd all been at Heathrow, they could have stopped it immediately. They couldn't get a guy in for 90 minutes and the whole thing closed down working from home. This will be exactly the same problem. And it's all because of COVID. It's all because we got 
we felt we got entitled to work wherever we want to work. How dare you tell me to come into work? You know, I'm a civil servant and I can do it on my screen at home. And it's an outrage. Why doesn't the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who's banging on about the fall in inflation today, very welcome, just say to the head of yeah. the HMRC, yeah. I'm the boss here. That's right. You'll man the phones all year round because you're a public service. Yeah. So well, Jacob, I'm all year round. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the problem is a lot of people get into absolute terrible panic when you get that envelope, of course that letter. They do. And you that, can't actually, get through yeah. to speak to anybody. And, and if you can't get through, it, I can imagine some dreadful things happening. Some older person is going to suddenly get this envelope and say, you owe X amount of money, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and they're going to panic. And it it's, could be a mistake. And it frequently Obviously. is. You know. yeah. It's absolutely outrageous. But, you know, the, the thing about working from home, I mean, when I was talking about the, the figures in the army, I thought, you know, people are going to be wanting to fight from home. At this mm. rate. It's absolutely. Blue. And it comes after the Public Accounts Committee said last week that the HMRC's customer service has hit an all-time oh. low. But, 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 but it's not even about working from home. It's about getting rid of people from jobs. Computers will do it. You just yeah. need someone to pick up the phone. It's much cheaper if an AI will do it. I think we're going to take some um, the end of the wedge again. footage at the moment, gentlemen. Yeah. Be on the edge of your seats. I think we're going to see um, Ed Davey. Oh. He is launching his uh, local um, election bid. Here he is. Is that the fourth place? Time's running out for Rishi. Look, they've got a cardboard cutout of a, a sand timer. That's high tech, isn't it? Oh, I mean, we're no. a bit anti, anti technological advancements mm. here, but I think that's taking it a bit far. And just in case you don't know who Ed Davey is, because a lot of people won't, he's the <laughs> Lib Dem leader. Yeah. He's Kingston, is his constituency, yeah. isn't it? Kingston up on Thames in Kingston Surrey. Kingston and uh, He's now stood with his back to the camera, which is yeah. excellent it's when you're uh, launching. It is an improvement. He always seems to have a very anguished look on his face. Okay. About something. And you know, he's I mean, just seen the polls. He's the <laughs> Liberal Democrats are now the fourth right. place party. Right, yeah. Behind reform. Behind, yeah. behind reform. Yeah. Lib Dems, as of today, fourth place party. Behind reform. He's yeah. got a lot of orange signs. Who on earth? He's actually in Hertfordshire. Yeah. Who on earth would vote for Lib Dem now? I don't know who their voters are. Do you, no. Mike? The man who let down the post office sub uh, yes. postmaster and sub postmistresses, okay? Yeah. Post, 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 yes, he's posted off postal minister for two years. Yes, absolutely. Followed by Joe Swinson. Remember her? Yeah, of course. Lib Dem leader for about yeah. Five. It's followed yeah. by Norman Lamb. So for yeah. five years of coalition, it was all Ab Lib Dem ministers, and they reported to the Secretary of State. Yeah. It was a Lib Dem, Vince mm Cable. Yes, ab Their ab problem. absolutely. Their yeah, problem. yeah, who absolutely. They, who do they appeal to now, Stephen? Well, I, I don't. They probably appeal to you know, sort of Jocasta and pomegranate, or you know, <laughs> you know sort of a young couple down there. But Sanders, what, what, this is what's dreadful. <laughs> what's dreadful about the Lib Dems is they've decided, in, in place of policies and in face of actually anything real, they're going to come up with these ludicrous stunts, like you know, driving buses through walls and. What's that the one when I was on the other day with you, they actually had a huge bus with Rishi Sunak's face on it. They did. Yeah, the first rule of politics, never, ever, ever sh show your enemy's face. But, I mean, I'd rather see some meat on the bone and some proper policies. What, what, what is he actually doing this, this morning? No. Well, he, he's talk, talking to meat on the bone. And, he, and he's talking to a couple of very nice women. Yeah, but what's he supposed to be... We don't what know. are they launching here? He's is now it? waving, sir. It's his local government campaign, because, of course, the local... I think this is their candidate for the mayor of oh, London, May the 2nd. Yeah. Right. No, that's, not, that's not their mayoral candidate. No, he's about 15 years old. Yeah. Well, well, right, yeah. that was the last launch. one. I he, he's, uh, he's and also, that was probably more interesting than if it was said. And he's also um, a man who, every time he's interviewed, demands that somebody should quit their job for not doing it properly, uh, uh, despite uh, the fact that he can't do his about, properly. Talking yeah. about people mm. not doing their job yeah. properly, your response to the idea that doctors have been trying to access her medical files, Stephen. Well, this, this is horrendous. I mean, I mean uh, the, the good news is that they found it out in time. But, I mean, do you remember when Boris Johnson was in St Thomas's Hospital? Yeah. And yes. people, reptiles, were swarming around or slithering around outside, offering huge sums of money yeah. to anybody who was wearing scrubs going, you know, you know, would you like to, you know, can we just see Boris Johnson's, mm. you know, embarrassing interior photographs? So it's pretty <laughs> horrendous, but, yeah, I mean, the last thing you want to do. Yeah. But the, the thing about the London Clinic is that it's supposed to be this place for, the, like, the VIP place. Matt, it always Miller used used to, Matt Millen used to go there, well, Princess it, Margaret. Well, yeah. yeah, and he, he, he had a prostate. Uh, yeah. But it used to be the King Edward VII Hospital they still for use yeah. that as well. officers yeah. and gentlemen. Yeah. I think that is the one that's really bulletproof. But, last yeah. one, Mike. Uh, well, you know, I think it's disgraceful, but I, I have got a Mayor Culpa as a tabloid journalist, mm. I once put on a white coat and got into <gasps> Peter Sellers' private room when he was in the Middlesex Hospital when he was on his deathbed, yeah. Um, and what did he do? Did he say it? Was he capable of speaking? No, he wasn't, no, he's in a coma. Uh, right. And Spike Milligan was sitting next to the bed with him. So did got, you, did you, you pretend to be a doctor? And try I didn't to pretend to be anything. I put a white coat on and I walked in and I walked around two or three times, just nodded my head, nodded to Spike got Milligan, bit, got a bit of came color. out again and then went and Great filed the exclusive story, yeah, absolutely. Well, well, extraordinary. Mm. Right, that was in the Will Lavington ring. I was a porter right, at the time. Harry, thank you for <laughs> now. Yeah. Can I actually say times have changed in the newspaper industry? Still Indeed. To come, it's been half a century since Princess Anne was nearly kidnapped. We're going to be talking to the man who took three bullets for her. That's right, that and much more. After your morning's news with Sophia Wensler.
Thanks, Bev. Good morning. It's 10.30. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your headlines. UK inflation has fallen more than expected to the lowest level in over two years. Official figures show UK inflation for February came in at 3.4%, down from 4%. Economists had forecast the Office for National Statistics figure would fall to 3.5%. Inflation is now closer to the Bank of England's 2% target and comes ahead of the latest interest rate decision on Thursday. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says it's good news for families. This is the lowest headline rate for two and a half years, but most encouragingly food inflation, which was nearly 20% a year ago, is now just 5%. And what this shows is that the plan to bring inflation down, it was over 11% when Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, uh, now just 3.4%. That plan is working, but we do need to stick to it and see it right the way through. Housing asylum seekers on barges, military bases and student digs will cost taxpayers more than the hotels are currently being used. The National Audit Office said housing those waiting for asylum decisions in alternative accommodation, such as the BB Stockholm barge and former RAF sites, would cost the Home Office £1.2 billion. That's £46 million more than using hotels and B&Bs. And while £230 million is expected to have been spent on developing four alternative sites by the end of the month, only two have opened so far and with reduced capacity. And an investigation has been launched at the London Clinic over claims staff try to access the Princess of Wales' private medical records. The Mirror has reported that at least one member of staff tried to access Kate's notes while she was a patient at the private hospital in central London in January. Princess Catherine was admitted to the hospital for abdominal surgery in January and has not attended a public engagement since. The UK Privacy and Data Protection Watchdog said it had received a breach in reports. Some Greg stores have been forced to close after being hit by an IT glitch at the tills. Some outlets have been forced to put temporary close notices on their doors, while others asked customers to place orders outside using the Greg's mobile app. A Greg spokesperson said it's working hard to resolve the issue. And for the latest story, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2692 and €1.1711. The price of gold is £1,697.22 per ounce and the FTSE 100 is at 7,719 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Still to come, we're going to be joined by the man who took three bullets for Princess Anne. This was 50 years ago. Did you cover this story, Andrew Pearce? Cheek. I was barely <laughs> born. I was in my short trousers. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. I do remember it, though. We're going to be talking to that man in the bed there himself. This is Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight, every night from 11pm. Is a debate on gender really a far-right issue? Far right. I'm so bored of that phrase, you know what I mean? Like, anyone who talks about... Anyone who acknowledges that there are two sexes is suddenly far right, because that's what, that's what Hitler and Mussolini were all about. Um, this, this question from Shirley is, of course, about Labour. They've been accused of being undemocratic because they pressured a pub into cancelling a debate, and this debate features Kelly J. Keane, who's been on the show a couple of times, uh, and she's a campaigner, and she was just on the panel, and then they got a letter saying that they couldn't do it because Kelly J. Keane apparently attracts far-right groups. Now, they've tried this trick before, but because some awful, ghastly neo-Nazi types turned up near to an event that she was holding in Australia, they kind of tried to blame that on her and suggest that the two were the same thing. They weren't. That was an opportunistic group turning up to... They're not... Neo-Nazis aren't pro-feminist. <laughs> they're, they're not pro an event called Let Women Speak. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> New Zealand's uh, TV uh, blurred her, uh, touching her zip, because they said that her touching her zip was a far-right uh, dog whistle, because she's... she's She's making that 
symbol. Yeah, but she wasn't making the symbol. Wow. She was just adjusting a zip. Yeah. And and all, also, this isn't a far-right symbol. I mean, that's, that was incredible because she obviously wasn't making that symbol anyway. She was just adjusting a top. But this New Zealand uh, news channel blurred out the hand so that they could <laughs> pretend that it was some horrible ghastly... Yeah. I mean, well, this she is she fingers to us, wasn't it? She's talked about having voted Labour in the past. She's yeah. so not far-right. But also, I mean, even if she were right-wing, which she yes. isn't, why would they be banning a panel where there's a discussion about an, one of the most important issues of our day? What well, are Labour playing at here? they're anti-democratic, aren't they? They're just kind of playing whack-a-mole with things they don't like. I think yeah. maybe I'll write to the pub and say, I do want to see Kelly J. Keane there. Yeah, but it's... they won't listen to you well, if you no, say they that, won't. will they? Because you've got the unfashionable opinion, Chris. Well, I'm the unfashionable workplace. <laughs> I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Glory DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So it's been 50 years since one of the most extraordinary royal moments of the modern era. It was a terrifying episode. A demented gunman tried to kidnap Princess Anne. Take on Princess Anne at your peril. The attack <laughs> was thwarted by a number of people, including a police bodyguard, Inspector Jim Beaton, who was shot three times during the incident. This man had a gun. And uh, he shot. 50 years ago, the Mall, famous for its pomp and ceremony, turned into a sinister crime scene. The daughter of Queen Elizabeth II, Princess Anne, and her then-husband, Captain Mark Phillips, were driving back to Buckingham Palace from a charity event. A Ford Escort cut up their royal car, and they were forced to stop. Armed with two pistols, assailant Ian Ball got out his car and approached the princess. He shot her protection officer, Inspector James Beaton, who tried to disarm him. Beaton returned fire, but missed before his gun jammed. He was shot twice more as he tried to protect the Queen's only daughter. Di Davies, former head of Royal Protection, thinks police in 1974 were unprepared. Well, it was totally inadequate. Then the training was very, very different because nobody actually thought anything like this could happen. There was no defensive driving training in those days. What you should have done, somebody pulls at you like that, uh, was to drive through him. Meanwhile, Ball attempted to kidnap Princess Anne. He demanded a reported three million pounds ransom, which he plans to give to the NHS. Well, he said I had to go with him. I said I didn't, didn't think I wanted you to go. Thank you very much. I, I was scrupulously polite, because I thought it was silly to be. No, too rude at that stage again. Well. <laughs> and chauffeur also tried to help, but was shot, as was nearby journalist Brian McConnell. PC Michael Hills, who's been guarding the Queen Mother's residence on the opposite side of the road at Clarence House, also came to help. Ian Ball shot him too, but he managed to call for backup. When he shot the police, when we managed to close the door... You eventually got the door back open again. He got the door back open, but in the process of getting the door back open... The back of my dress split from top to bottom, and all the sh shoulders went out of it. And that was his most dangerous moment. But I... <laughs> Former boxer Ronnie Russell passed by and realised what was happening. He then punched Ian Ball as hard as he could. There are various accounts of what happened next, but the end result was that Ian Ball was arrested. Ball pleaded guilty to attempted murder and kidnapping. He was sectioned under the Mental Health Act, having been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Nowadays, police protection officers are highly trained. Police outriders and backup vehicles are common practice. Miraculously, those who were shot survived, and Princess Anne visited them in hospital. Queen Elizabeth II awarded the George Medal to the boxer who punched Ball. The other heroes that night were also rewarded.
Today, the Princess Royal is consistently rated the hardest working member of the royal family. A firm support for her brother, the King, who continues regular cancer treatment. Cameron Walker, GB News. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Amazing. Extraordinary. And also, she was unflappable, apparently, yeah. the Princess Royal. She's she just brilliant. refused to get out of the car and said, I'm not going anywhere. Extraordinary. Well, Jim Beaton was awarded the George Cross for protecting the princess and delighted to say, joins us now, along with the former head of Royal Royalty Protection, Di Davis. Jim, you won't remember, but I met you some time ago at the Imperial War Museum when Princess Anne was opening an exhibition to do with the George Cross and you were there reunited with her. Um, and you told me then what great admiration you had for the princess, cool under fire, but you didn't do so badly yourself. Well, the slight difference was really that uh, it was probably my job. And also, um, I had a wee bit of police training, not very much, but a little bit. Uh, whereas uh, Princess Anne had nothing, and yet, the way she displayed it, you would have thought she'd been uh, highly trained to um, deal with any type of that situation. Mm. Jim, does it feel like 50 years ago, when you go through something that makes the headlines, and also just on a personal level, is, is kind of traumatic, I imagine? It never really leaves you, I bet. Um, no, I'm too thick for it to be traumatic. <laughs> but uh, it does... Um, it doesn't really feel like uh, 50 years ago, I must admit. Um, when somebody mentioned it last week, I um, was say, a little bit surprised and suddenly thought, oh, I suppose it is. <laughs> um, it, uh, it was an incident. You know, it happened and uh, big made big changes in the police protection, obviously. Uh, but um, no, it's, it's passed fine and I've been busy. I've got family and golf and stuff like that. So time passes. Mm. So it goes on as normal, really. But back then, Jim, even, police, even though you'd had some training, you took three bullets for the princess. You effectively stood between her and a deranged gunman. Well, I was supposed to be a protection officer, really. So, uh, you know, I keep saying there was only two, two things to do, and one was go forward and the other was go back. So um, I just tried to fuddle about. You must remember that back in 1974, there was no communication, and we were extremely lucky that Michael Hills, who was outside Clarence House and nearby, had got one of the fast police radios, um, or radios on his shoulder, so he was able to send a message out. Otherwise, we would have just been relying in the good old public to phone in and say there was something happening. Yeah, it so would be... times have changed drastically. It would be very different now. No doubt somebody would have caught it on an iPhone, probably, Jim. There'd be footage of what happened. It would be very different. How would it? How do you think it would compare now being a Royal Protection Officer today compared to 50 years ago? Oh, it's a different job altogether. I mean, we were uh, very much the bottom of the pile as far as, say, uh, police regarded us, but uh, nowadays, you know, it, it's a well-trained, highly selected, um, lots of money spent on it and everything. I mean, we didn't have radios in the cars, we had nothing, we had no backup. Mm. Um, we just, everything plodded along, really. We, it was one of these things that um, had not fallen into um, oblivion, but that sort of idea, because there was many more things happening. It was only um, when Ian Ball caused this problem that mm. uh, the protection came to the fore, really, uh, with a vengeance. And uh, money was spent and everything under the sun, including new guns, new bullets, backup cars, uh, many more police officers. Mm. So the whole thing was a dramatic change. Let's bring Di Davis in here. Di, of course, what Jim's saying there, it has all changed. There's no way that lunatic, I assume, would have been able to get anywhere as near to the princess's car as he did 50 years ago, let alone open the door. Well, you're absolutely right, but let me pay tribute to Jim. What an incredible man he is and remains. Uh, 
he fundamentally, uh, or that incident fundamentally changed how royalty protection started to improve in his day. As I recall, there are only about 10 personal protection officers. Now there are many, many more, quite rightly. And again, he uh, attributes to the training now that these officers do go, and clearly it has changed out of all recognition. But you know, history repeats itself, so you could never, ever think it couldn't happen again. But of mm. course, now having had the kind of history and the performance that he showed, those officers now selected, I hope, are up to his level of duty and ability. He tried his best, but he did so in, in uh, circumstances which, frankly, today could never have happened. Mm. So I'm pleased in one sense that it happened because it actually laid the foundation for what is now the modern protection outfit that uh, hopefully it, it, it is and the level of expertise that goes with it. Mm. Jim, just tell us... Um... What she was, what she was like, Princess Anne. Um, we know her as indomitable and hardworking. What was she like to work with close up? Um, very good, generally. Um, she was um, open. She obviously had a protection officer from the time she was born, so she was. Um, you were just part of the. Um, group, really. Um, but she was very good, um, always cool, calm and collected, um, sometimes a wee bit forthright, but that was fine. You knew where you stood and what was happening. Mm. Um, so overall, it, it was very good. OK. All right. Thank you so much. What a lovely piece of history. And I think yeah. it's so interesting to reflect on these occasions 50 years later. Jim Beaton there, who was awarded the George Cross. What a hero. And former head of Royal Protection Command, Di Davis. I wonder if that scene's been in the Crown. I've not got to that bit yet in the Crown series. I think it is, It actually. must be. It's yeah. too good not to be. Because it was an extraordinary moment. Yeah, right. Up next, one in five police are set to resign from the force over the next two years. That's right. What needs to change? Do they need a pay rise? You're with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Bit of a drab start for most of us today. Dull and damp. The brightest skies are going to be across Northern Ireland and Western Scotland, where we should see some lengthy spells of sunshine. Elsewhere, sunshine in short supply. Generally dry and fine across the southeast. It may cheer up here, but a damp start for eastern Scotland, southern Scotland. The rain will tend to ease here through the day, but it stays uh, pretty dank across northern England, particularly Yorkshire, parts of North Wales. The rain on and off, but fairly low. Light. To the south of that, mostly dry and still pretty mild. 18 Celsius is possible with a bit of sunshine. Some sunnier skies across the northwest. A, a cooler day here with a, a fresher feel in the cooler air, but still plenty of sunshine, feeling pleasant enough. The rain and drizzle will trickle away from eastern parts of England through this evening. Much of uh, the UK will become dry by midnight, but then after midnight, more rain comes into the far northwest. The wind's picking up here as well. Quite a bit of cloud around. Could see some mist and fog where we keep some clearer skies. Temperatures may in rural spots get close to freezing. On to Thursday then, and generally a dry, fine day for England and Wales. A brighter day, certainly to the east of the Pennines compared to today. Still a fair bit of cloud elsewhere, but some bright or sunny spells in the south. Outbreaks of rain will move in across Scotland and Northern Ireland through the day, so a, a blustery and a fairly wet day here. Rain on and off throughout. Again, fairly mild for most of us, with temperatures generally in the teens. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Very good morning, 10.50. Police are in crisis. Figures reveal that one in five officers are set to quit the service within the next two years. Join us in the studio to talk about this. Former Detective Superintendent at the Met, Shabnam Chowdhury, great friend of this programme. Shabnam, we know what a lot of this is about, um, apart from the fact, if you think about the Met, the reputational damage done by so many scandals, but also money, possibly. <laughs> It's about it's money. Nice. It's about, uh, well, if you looked at what happened last week, the Met Police announced that they are going to make redundant 60 detectives. Yeah, in um, the murder squad. In the murder squad. So, basically, they won't kick people out, so to speak, but they'll make have natural wastage and then they won't replace them. That puts a huge strain on policing. That also stops people from wanting to join, because people join with mm. an idea of what they actually want to do. So, to come into policing, if they want to be on the murder command, knowing that those opportunities are not going to be there, they'll go somewhere else. Did they, do we not need those officers anymore in the murder? Are there just fewer murders? We don't need so yeah. many murder squad officers? I don't think so. No, you do need more murder off squad officers. They'll go from, I think it's about five detectives per team down to three, and you have like north, south, east, and west uh, command teams. But they don't deal with just murders. For example, they'll deal with a whole range of other attempted murders, kidnappings. Mm. They may get involved in other jobs that boroughs don't have the resources, which comes back to pay um, and um, the number of officers that are leaving or joining. Um, it's like a revolving door. The more that join, the more are leaving. And I talk to police officers sometimes too, and they say the other thing about the job is that we just get worn down by the admin and the paperwork and the bureaucracy. And I, if I had a pound for every mm. Home Secretary who's told me we're going to sort that out, if they don't, it gets worse. Well, it's got slightly better over the years, but when you're doing online reporting or yeah. online, when, even when you're calling the Crown Prosecution Service, you could be holding onto the phone for about an hour exactly. just before you get a decision to charge. That could take two to three hours. That is. You don't into... have a hotline? The police don't have a hotline? No, they don't through. have a hotline because Still thousands right. of police officers are calling into the various Crown right. Prosecution Departments. You might have some CPS officers that work directly within police stations, but that is also very rare. But look, this is also about pay. Yeah. If you think about it, last year, um, the Met, uh, the policing across the board was uh, offered a 7% increase in pay. That was on the 1st of September. But actually, the Social Market Foundation published a report last year where they said that um, in real time, since 2000, police officers have actually suffered a cut of 17%. Uh, 17 so actually, they're still on the back foot. Mm. In order for police officers to join, you've got to make the job more attractive. Yeah. When you've got low confidence, when you've got police officers being kicked out left, right and centre. When you've got police officers that are getting really good skills, they get to 15 years in policing and they think, actually, why would I be a police officer and earn this sort of money, low pay, really, in comparison to some others, when I can go and become a train driver or I can go and work for some big company, oil company, who do investigations and pay me 120000 a year? And I've had officers leave to do those kind of jobs with that kind of pay. How bleak is the prognosis then, looking forward to the next couple <clears> of decades? Well, so I'm thinking about my son. I can't imagine that his his mates would want to be police officers. That's very sexist, isn't it? I've got daughters as well, but it doesn't look like an attractive job anymore to that generation. It's not. The only thing I would add the, the, uh, to that is it's not like in it's not in uh, just a critical crisis. It's in a serious critical crisis. But there are a lot of young people out there who finish. Um, uh, education or come in to do a degree within policing, when you think about the uh, attraction then, it's about £28,000. Other jobs offer twenty one or £22,000. Yeah. So it might be a good offer for the first two to five years. Yeah. Yeah. And then they think, right, I've got some skills, I've got the experience, I'm out. Yeah, as are we. We've just run out of time, Shabnam. Thank you, though. Good to see you. It's still to come. Intermittent fasting has been endorsed by a range of public figures, from Kim Kardashian to Rishi Sunak. <laughs> A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hello and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Today we've got some rain spilling its way south and eastwards, the best of the brightness up towards the northwest and fairly mild across the country. Now that's down to this weather front that we've got sitting through central parts of the country, bringing this mild air across the UK. But as it eases from the northwest, you can see some brighter skies pushing in to western Scotland and Northern Ireland through this afternoon. So that's where we'll see the best of the sunshine. Quite grey, quite murky and cloudy with rain and drizzle, some heavier bursts through the day across England and Wales, but down towards the southeast, it should stay dry. We'll see some brightness with highs of 16 or 17 Celsius. Through Wednesday evening then, that rain continues to filter its way south and eastwards, tending to die out as it does through the night. A lot of cloud left in its wake, though some pockets of mist and fog developing and a few clear spells, particularly for the north and the northwest. But later in the night, you can see this cloud and rain gathering across western Scotland and Northern Ireland, so turning quite wet and windy by the end of the night. But typically temperatures around where they should be for this time of year, a generally mild night. Wet and windy start to the day, though, for Scotland and Northern Ireland. That rain continuing to pile in through the day. The winds picking up across the country, turning quite windy in the far northwest. But a breezy picture elsewhere, bright and breezy for England and Wales. Some sunny spells from time to time, just making it feel a little fresher than today. But still highs of 15 or 16. I'll see you soon. Bye bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash, text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
11 a.m. on Wednesday, the 20th of March. This is Britain's News on GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. Very good morning. So, breaking this morning, inflation plummets to its lowest level for more than two years. Will the Bank of England now be forced to cut interest rates? Inflation is down from 4% during the year to January to 3.4% during the year to February. The cost of living crisis is easing for some, but what are the details? I'll be breaking down the numbers. And Kate's security breach this morning. Shocking claims unauthorised staff at the London Clinic tried to access the Princess of Wales' private me medical record. What do, what do they know? Who are they? Have they been sacked? potentially very serious breach of the Princess of Wales's private medical information, but what are the implications of Kensington Palace and the London Clinic? More details shortly. And can vaping now be linked to cancer? The first potential link between e-cigarettes and the diseases revealed today, but what are the risks and is it time for a ban on the so-called safer smoking alternative? And Britain's backfiring diversity push. At last, the business secretary, Kemi Badnock, says inclusion policy should not come, get this, at the expense of white men in the workplace. A bit late. And taxman not available. HMRC is introducing an annual summer break on its phone lines to push customers online. Is that good news for you? I imagine not. Good That's for her. controversial of Kemi. I don't her. know. I mean, I, uh, call me uh, sort of a new radical, but I think white men are still doing quite they well are. in the workplace. But, but, but you know, inclusion policies never ever mention white men. There's probably a reason for that. Yeah, Statistically, well, yeah, you're still yeah, doing yeah, all right. But this inclusivity agenda has gone too far. It's too woke, and she's just trying to say, "Hang on, let's be." Let's not exclude everybody. Correct. Uh, it, what I don't like are policies that are dividing people. Let's no, bring exactly everyone together under that's, their And that's merits. what all this inclusivity do, does. And it's also costing the taxpayer often tens of millions of pounds, particularly in the NHS, which hasn't got any money. Let us know your thoughts. GB Views at GBNews.com. Are white men a minority that need to be uh, have their corner fought for? Uh, first, though, here's the very latest news with Sophia Wensler. Thanks, Bev. Good morning. It's one minute past 11. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. Your top story this hour, UK inflation has fallen more than expected to the lowest level in over two years. Official figures show UK inflation for February came in at 3.4%, down from 4%. Economists had forecast the Office for National Statistics figure would fall to 3.5%. Inflation is now closer to the Bank of England's 2% target and comes ahead of the latest interest rate decision on Thursday. This is the lowest headline rate for two and a half years, but most encouragingly food inflation which was nearly 20% a year ago, is now just 5%. And what this shows is that the plan to bring inflation down, it was over 11% when Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister, uh, now just 3.4%. That plan is working, but we do need to stick to it and see it right the way through. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt speaking there. Now, Shadow Business and Trade Secretary Jonathan Reynolds welcomed the drop, but said we still need to see inflation coming down further. Where I would direct my criticism would be towards the government because, as Liam Halligan correctly identified, if you look at some of the reasons we've been so uniquely exposed to high inflation, well, exposure to high fossil fuel prices, the government doubling down on that rather than finding alternatives, um, a lot of people not back in the labour market after the pandemic because they're waiting for NHS treatment, that's the responsibility of the government. I think even looking at the, the way the agreement with the European Union was done, where we've got a lot of friction still in terms of food prices and how food and agri products are transported between here and the European Union. Those are the things I think the government should have, have a look at and been a much greater priority. Housing asylum seekers on barges, military bases and student digs will cost taxpayers more than the hotels currently being used. The National Audit Office said housing those waiting for asylum decisions in alternative accommodation, such as the BB Stockholm barge and former RAF sites, would cost the Home Office £1.2 billion. That's £46 million more than using hotels and B&Bs. And while £230 million is expected to have been spent on developing four alternative sites by the end of the month, only two have opened so far and with reduced capacity. 
Meanwhile, at least eight dinghies carrying migrants have been reported in the Channel this morning. UK and French authorities are responding and 92 people have already been counted by GB News, disembarking from a border force boat in Dover. The surge is being attributed to favourable weather conditions and takes the number of asylum seekers who've arrived in small boats this year to 3,600. Time's running out for Rishi Sunak. The message from Ed Davey as he launches the Liberal Democrats' local elections campaign. The Lib Dems leader kicked off the party's English local election campaign in Blue Wall, Hertfordshire, where the Lib Dems made major gains last year. Ed Davey revealed his message to the Prime Minister as he unveiled a blue and gold hourglass in front of Liberal Democrat activists. In other news, an investigation has been launched at the London Clinic over claims staff tried to access Princess of Wales' private medical records. The Mirror has reported that at least one member of staff tried to access Catherine's notes while she was a patient at the private hospital in central London in January. Princess Catherine was admitted to the hospital for abdominal surgery in January and has not attended a public engagement since. The UK Privacy and Data Protection Watchdog said it had received a breach report. London Underground drivers will stage two 24-hour walkouts in a long-running dispute over terms and conditions. Members of ASLEF will strike on April the 8th and May the 4th, threatening travel misery across the capital. ASLEF drivers have voted by 98% in favour of industrial action. And the government's aim to create a smoke-free generation is one step closer today as the tobacco and vapes bill is introduced to the House of Commons. Under the new bill, anyone turning 15 this year or younger will never legally be sold cigarettes. Government figures show that smoking costs the UK around £17 billion a year. If the bill passes, ministers say smoking rates among those aged 14 to 30 could be near zero by 2040. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Andrew and Bev. It's 11.07 with Britain's News and GB News with Andrew Pearce and Beth Turner. Greg's have released a statement this morning. We have now resolved the technical issue that affected tills in some of our shops earlier this morning. The majority of them affected now to take card and cash payments again and we expect the issue to be fully resolved shortly. We apologise for the inconvenience this may have caused to our customers. So they're not saying whether it was. Mm. It is odd, isn't it? Three, four now in three days, four days. This is Donald, just... Sainsbury's, Tesco's and now Greg's. All you know what, same. unfortunately, this is... Any of us who've battled with our printer at home will understand yeah. that tech is not always our friends. I am digesting my sausage roll. You're digesting your uh, pan of chocolat. I'm full of pastry and regret <laughs> right now, I can't lie. Um, but it was very delicious. Big news today, though. Um, inflation has fallen um, by... To 3.4%. We're going to, we're going to find out about, about that in just first. a moment, we're though. We're going back to the Royal Story. Um, Liam Halligan is waiting to bring us yeah. up, to, up to date on that. But the big news this morning is yeah. that Princess of Wales medical record, Cameron Walker, is outside the London clinic. Cameron, this clinic is really well known for looking after the um, most privileged, let's say, in our society, especially the royal family. This is really embarrassing for them. Well, absolutely, Bev. This building behind me is well used for decades now, dealing with and treating royalty, celebrities and politicians. They pride themselves on, in their words, providing excellence in one place. And in January, the Princess of Wales was admitted here for what Kensington Palace described at the time as planned abdominal surgery. And last night, the Daily Mirror reported that at least one member of staff here had allegedly attempted to access the Princess of Wales's private medical records. Now, it was also reported that bosses of the hospital immediately contacted Kensington Palace upon discovering the alleged breach and were investigating. Now, Kensington Palace told me last night that this is a matter for the London Clinic. They told the Mirror in, this, in a statement that we firmly believe that all our patients, no matter their status, deserve total privacy and confidentiality. Well, this morning, the Information Commissioner's Office has uh, confirmed to me and GB News uh, that they had received a breach report and are assessing 
accessing the information provided. But this is potentially incredibly serious because uh, uh, accessing somebody's private medical information, if you are an NHS staffer or indeed a private medical staffer, is potentially a criminal offence. And this morning, Health Minister uh, Maria Caulfield said that she believes that the Metropolitan Police had been asked to look into it. Now, a spokesperson for the Metropolitan Police had said they are not aware they are not aware of any referral at so far this morning. But of course, this is in the context, isn't it, of the hounding of the Princess of Wales over the last few months, particularly the last couple of weeks with the online conspiracy theories and the videos taken by members of the public and people are speculating about her health. So this does potentially have wider implications. And remember, it's not just the Princess of Wales who's been treated in that hospital. The King is still an outpatient here receiving regular cancer mm. treatment. Oh, very good point, Cameron. Hadn't thought about that, actually. Exactly. Um, right, thanks Cameron. Um, keep us up to speed. I'm sure there are some PR people in that hospital now with their heads in their hands working out how to deal with this. Oh, well, there's an, it's, it is a disaster for them. Yeah, it's awful. Because confidentiality, privacy is everything in a place like it that. It is. Well, for everybody's medical yes. records, not just the princess as well. Should always be. Now, inflation has plummeted to 3.4% this month from 4% in January. Is that a plummet? I think that's a pretty big plummet. That's bigger than expected. Uh, what do these figures mean for you? Here to break it all down is our very own, very fine economics and business editor, Liam Halligan, with On The Money. Is Britain still an inflation nation? Apparently not, say Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Chancellor Jeremy Hunt. The plan is working, said the Chancellor this morning. Inflation has not just fallen decisively, but is forecast to hit the 2% target within months. Well, we've certainly suffered a lot of inflation in recent years, haven't we? Look at that. Back in October 2022, inflation was all the way up at 11.1%. That's a 40-year high. It's since fallen pretty steadily, but not in a straight line. And in recent months, it's been stuck at 4%. So what actually happened today when the ONS released some figures? We had inflation of 3.4%, a big reduction during the year to February. So prices went up on average by 3.4% during those 12 months, and that's the lowest CPI inflation number since September 2021. Let's have a look at the breakdown. Why is inflation falling? Because food prices are going up at a slower rate. Back in March 2023, 19% food price inflation. That's a 45-year high. It's fallen quite sharply. It's now at 4.5%. So still, prices of food are going up, but much less slowly. How about petrol and diesel? Well, petrol and diesel prices across the year have actually been coming down. Petrol in February 2023 was almost 4% cheaper than a year earlier, and diesel was almost 11% cheaper on the year. But in recent weeks, petrol and diesel prices have been creeping, creeping back up. I know, and that's because of the oil price. And I'll come on to that in one moment. How about those pesky household utility bills? They've also been falling over the last year. Electrics, electricity, gas and other domestic fuel prices are down 18.2%, says the Office for National Statistics, over the last 12 months. So what does this mean for interest rates? When inflation falls, the Bank of England is more likely to cut interest rates. We've seen a huge rise in interest rates since that COVID lockdown all the way up to 5.25%. We've got a decision tomorrow from the Bank of England at 12 noon. I'll be there as ever explaining what's going on. But I still don't think the Bank of England is going to cut interest rates for now. They're going to want to see inflation much closer to that 2% target. And there could be some fly in the ointment when it comes to bringing inflation down from our old friend, the oil price. Already we've seen petrol and diesel prices going up in recent weeks. That's because... Recently, oil prices have spiked up on geopolitical tensions, Russia, Ukraine, Palestine, Hamas, and all the rest of it, from $80 a barrel to $89 a barrel over the last few weeks. That's an 11% rise. The Tories are hoping desperately that this lower inflation will push up real wages, take home pay, and there'll be an economic bounce before an election. This sets the scene for better economic conditions, which could allow further progress on our ambition to boost growth and make work pay, says Chancellor Jeremy Hunt. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Downing Street strategists looking at the opinion poll lead that Labour has, they live in hope. 
Thank you, Liam. Thank you so much. Now, you've been getting in touch at home about HMRC just not bothering to man the phones for six months this year so that you can go online and do it all so efficiently. But it's like uh, calling a summer break. Six months. <laughs> George is saying many people like to get their tax sorted and paid ASAP, get it out of the way. If people have problems, they'll need to wait until September then to sort them out. It will potentially be a huge shortfall of revenue during this time. Yeah, but it's the cost, the, the taxpayer, and it's a customer, the taxpayer who'll be penalised, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and hopefully this means that staff at HMRC will be reduced by a significant amount, says Noel. It does mean that, Noel, but that's not necessarily a good thing. No. We need people in work, don't we? What are they going to do instead? We want to answer on the phone talking to people, talking it through your tax, because a lot of people don't understand their tax. He wants someone to explain it. Bring back human beings, I say. Yeah. And prisoners and princess and kidnap. Fifty years. We spoke to James Beeson earlier, as the what security nice officer, who got three bullets. Wonderful of his generation. Amazing. And Alex said Prince Philip commented later that the kidnapper wouldn't have kept her long, as he wouldn't have been able to cope with her. He did <laughs> say that. British actually. Humour that I love. And BBC taking on adverts in some of their online content and their apps. Andrew said the Beeb could easily save millions of pounds by scrapping its entire a weather forecasting operation. Good point. Why can't they use the Met Office instead of the taxpayer and licence fee funding both? The Met Office do a wonderful job for GB News. There's so much BBC waste, isn't there? So much. We were just reading in the paper about a team of 60 yeah. who work at BBC Verify. That's the fact-checking organisation. Why they have to have a fact-checking organisation? Why the journalists and the staff can't check their own facts? Quite. That's what you do. That's, That's what we do right. here. Absolutely. Now, still to come... What comes to mind you think of James Bond? Not usually a self-declared feminist who groans his own kale. Our panel aren't impressed. What do you think? You Don't like know. him. Well, I like him. You are with Britain's Newsroom and on Can GB you remember News. his name? Aaron Taylor Johnson. There we are. Are you sure? I think so. Right. This is GB News. Britain's news channel. Now, I'm sure you have seen this video that went viral this week, and if you I haven't, really well, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, this is a firefighter leaning on a fence whilst watching a trapped driving instructor's car sink <laughs> in four feet of flood water. Looks very comfortable there, doesn't he? Just leaning against the just fence. Just chilling, just yeah. relaxing. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were two... Uh, so, there were, in fact, two Essex fire and rescue crews, an ambulance and a police car parked near the sinking vehicle, but they wouldn't enter the water because they had to wait for specialist crews who were trained for, for the water depth. Uh, well, two people who weren't going to sit back and watch were these two, Jack and Danielle Price, who took it upon themselves to rescue the submerged driver. And Danielle joins us now. Very good morning to you, Danielle. And you are a hero, an absolute hero. What happened in this video? Make sense of it for us. So we were filming in the area for our YouTube channel and we've seen the fire brigade come through. I was actually out at five o'clock in the morning with my husband, Jamie. We, we know it always happens there, as you can see. Um, and it was clear. We've seen the fire brigade come through, we've followed them, and they're just standing around as if nothing's happened. Um, in the clip, it says um, he's fine, he's, he's, in, he's on his phone, um, and then sort of walked away. But what they failed to realise is when my partner actually opened the door, as you can hear, He's on the phone to the, the the sort of the emergency crew in panic, thinking he's going to sink. Um, so we could not just sit there and watch. Um, he's absolutely terrified. Yeah, poor bloke. Well done, you. Do you reckon this is health and safety gone mad? It is because although I do sympathise with them, they are so red taped. But surely, sort of common sense has to kick in as open the door. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially 
yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. What is the time? 11.19. Uh, Stephen Pound's with us again, uh, the former MP and the broadcaster Mike Parry in the studio. Mike, you want to show us something, don't you? Come well, I, yes, I am, because, <laughs> oh, uh, oh, because on, this is it. very important. Here we go. Right. Now, oh, oh, I don't want to show you my leg. Action. I want Ooh, to show you my shoe. Mike, you're going to do yourself a mix. Right. I, I will. I, I, can feel, I can feel my thigh muscle going right. already. So this is a very <laughs> smart shoe. Yes. Or training shoe. So right. Why are you showing it to us, Right. Mike? Well, this is probably a £100 Adidas shoe. Uh, yeah, other yeah. brands are available. Other brands are available. But the point is, the story is that... Joe Biden, the man who leads the Western world, now wears shoes like this. He's got uh, 115 pounds worth of trainers because of the sole. I don't know if we can see the sole, but the sole has suckers on it, which keeps your foot, you know... Uh, it's just to stop him tumbling. It's it stop him falling over. Now, my colleague at the other end of this table, Mr Pound, wears fantastic leather shoes, but there I don't... Go. I don't. Can I just say, I've done some weird yeah. items on this channel in the last two yeah. years, but yeah. I think this is right up there with one yeah. of the weirdest. These are leather yeah. shoes, by the way, with plastic soles. They're enough. These are buffed boots, mate. They're plastic yeah. soles. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is the point of this, I think, is the fact yeah. that Joe Biden yeah. I've got soul. needs so special doddery. shoes to stop him falling well, well, over. Well, no, you see, you see I, I'm quite sympathetic to this. I'm a gentleman entering early middle age, OK? <laughs> now, you I, know... I, I can see that in the rearview mirror. Well, that's very kind of you. But you know, outside this building, there are walkways which are tiled and, and they get quite wet and quite slippy. Yeah. And I've given up wearing the sort of shoes that Stephen's got because the sole is like a mirror. Mm. It's, it's very smooth, whereas the shoes I wear now have great sort of, you know, suckers on the bottom, and you feel really more confident moving around on those sort of shoes. Welcome, so, to, welcome um, to the, the shoe hour <laughs> yeah, here yeah. Uh, at GB News. Yeah. Today, Spons we've got Mike Timpsons. Parry talking Spons about... Sponsored by Timpsons. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, if this was a BBC, yeah. we'd actually say, yeah, this... buy those Timpsons. No, it's a serious point. The fact is, Stephen, yeah. you like Biden. Yeah. He's a doddery old man who's not very st st solid on his pins. Yeah. He's had a number of falls, yeah. fallen in and out of Air, yeah. of Air Force, one, and they're so worried about her now. He's wearing these trainers, mm. which is not normally the look you'd expect for the leader of the Western world. Well, no, it's true. He, 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 to wear something rather smart because yeah. they're worried he's going to end up on his backside. Yes, that's absolutely head. true. Extraordinarily, he made a brilliant State of the Union speech in the Senate last week. It was a really, really good speech. Now, whether he can only do that once a fortnight, mm. I don't know. Or but once a year. Remain, yeah. What does it say about America? A, that the fact that these are the two people who are going to probably likely to be the candidates, and B, well, he's candidates. actually got a chance of beating Trump. Now, what does that, on earth does that say? Desperately sad. Well, we've seen Trump, haven't we, very recently what on this very channel. Really I, I, I thought he was brilliant. Yeah. I thought Trump was brilliant. And uh, it, I think he has a sense of purpose. Whether you like him or not, he has a sense of purpose. And he said two things I entirely agree with. There wouldn't have been a Ukraine and there wouldn't have been a Gaza if he'd have been the President of the United States. Because, because Putin wouldn't know how he'd react, Hamas wouldn't know how... Yeah, and not only that, reacting. he didn't even blame Biden. He went right back to Obama. Yeah. He said, this all started, and he presumably meant Syria, yeah. when Obama talked about the red line and if the red line's Chemical crossed. weapons. It, it, absolutely. Nothing was done, and I sincerely believe we'd be in a safer world if um, Donald Trump was the president. I think he's got I, a point, because if you met... He did say that, Obama, that chemical weapons would be a red line to mm, the United certainly States did. Yeah. the Syria yeah. war, yeah. and he used chemical weapons on his own people. Well, he, they did yeah. nothing. Americans did nothing. Yeah, he, he used chemical weapons and barrel bombs. And it, I mean, yeah. the, the point—the point is, you know, it's a, John Wayne said, you shouldn't write checks with your mouth that your fists can't cash. Quite. And the problem, but I, I honestly don't think that Hamas would have actually reigned in their, their genocidal horror if Trump had what, been the what, president. What about Ukraine? I think Ukraine's an interesting one because the, I mean, Putin and uh, Trump, to a certain level, you could, they're both sort of populist leaders who say the unsayable. And in some ways, I think they, they could be a grain of truth in that. I think you it's a criticism of Putin called a populist, a man who represses. Of course. Is, yeah, uh, um, yeah. Well, well, no, 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 no. Sorry, I meant, I meant, and I, kills no, anybody. I meant, I meant the populist in the point yeah. of view of the, of that, yeah. the way he projects himself with these great big uh, uh, orchestrated. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. and, and the fact that he only got eighty-seven percent of the vote. The, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's thirteen. Clarity's waning. Well, thirteen yeah. percent of the Russian population are probably going to disappear by Friday. Yeah. <laughs> the, the reason why I think Hamas might not have happened is because the agreements they were coming to for a huge peace the Abrahamic deal, Abrahamic Accords, the Abraham yeah. Accords yeah. in the Middle East. Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem was, when Biden got in, he took his foot off the, off the accelerator on them. 
And, and that gave a lull to it, and people thought they're not that committed as they yeah. were. Yeah. What I'm saying is Trump would have gone full throttle on that until he got a deal. That's why I don't think Hamas would have happened. And what did you... Did you watch the interview, Stephen? I, I did, indeed. Scoop, yeah. It was a great scoop for GB News. Well, it was, yeah. not half. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, somebody said to me, the next he said, who was that bloke up there with Nigel Farage? <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, it, it was extraordinary. Uh, and I, I think GB News, I hate to tell you this, but you're actually becoming mainstream now. I mean, yeah. This is the difficulty. I mean, people. Well, I, the number of times you see GB News quoted in the new, in the yeah, newspapers it, it, over exactly. and over again. I mean, that, I mean, it was an extraordinary. I mean, stuff, some of the stuff in there was gold dust. Prince Harry could be refused entry to the United yep. States yeah, or kicked out rather. Or yep. kicked out. I mean, mm. amazing. Mm. You know, nobody else has. Because he may have laid, lied on his visa application mm. about drugs. Well, exactly. That's I'm, right. I don't. I don't. You, journos, you don't call it a scoop anymore, do you? But I mean. Well, yes, you do. I think if it's a true scoop, as that as that yeah. was, and, and the other yeah. bit of course was a scoop, a double he clarified scoop. Clarified the yeah. situation. Yeah. the relationship between America and NATO yeah. Yeah. Yes, and made it very clear. All I'm asking you guys to do is pay your pay bills, your bills. Yeah. and then you will have the defence shield yeah. of and, NATO. And, and the stuff about bloodshed, because he got a lot of flack that yeah. Trump from, from the BBC and others, yeah. Yeah. and he was talking about bloodshed car industry. in the car industry if they get a Biden victory. Well, he, he was using the expression bloodshed not in terms of literally blood on the street, but yeah. he was actually talking about, you know, a, a, an exsanguination of the economic... of the yeah. economy. Yeah. 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 You can see where he's coming from. Well, he's ahead of the game. He knows that yeah. China are trying to flood the world yeah. with very cheap electric vehicles at the moment. Yeah. 7,000 yeah. well, 7, yeah. arrived yeah. in this country yeah. in the last month. We have trailed this James Bond story now. Mm. All of the media yesterday was saying that Aaron Taylor Johnson was going to well, be the, the next scoop, James Bond. Mm -hmm. Double page, <laughs> page in the sun. Now, you we said that still dismissively. haven't had clarification <laughs> as to whether he does want this part. And in fact, there's an interview that he's given to Rolling Stone magazine where he said he doesn't want it. Is that good news if he doesn't want it, Stephen? I don't know. As soon as I read that this man grows his own kale, I thought to myself, yeah. is this... Hang on, you've got an allotment. I know, but I don't grow kale on it. Good oh, kale. And you're Steve. not likely to be James Spuds, Bond, Spuds, carrot. You? Well, mm. uh, well, funny enough, if there's a vacancy... Best, <laughs> best one in the world, Stevie. You make it... What's the, what's the mad professor who does the inventions? What? Uh, what, Q? Jane? Q. Yeah, yeah, Q. Q. Yeah. Maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pay attention, Bond. Mm -hmm. Pay attention, Bond. Yeah. But, but, I, well, no. but surely yeah. this is a no, modern a, Bond. He's we've been expecting old. you, Mr Bond. Mm. He's got a much older <laughs> yeah. wife. I've, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that. Well, she's brilliant. She's, she's a great she's, film producer. She's, yeah. she's successful in her yeah. own yeah. right. They've yeah. got two yeah. children yeah. together. Yeah. What's your objection to him? Just that he grows kale? No, no. I'm being a tad facetious here. No, my objection is he doesn't seem to know whether he is or he isn't. I mean, where did the story come from? It must have come from somewhere. Yeah, Sam. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. They yeah. said they've got a world exclusive they and they said that they they've... They've signing contracts this week. Uh, and that it, they've been in touch with... Uh, uh, what, broccoli, is... Yeah, Barbara Broccoli. Barbara Broccoli or kale. And trolls it really uh, Absolutely. But I'm, I'm really glad that if uh, it's true he's not going to take it, don't take it. Too woke for me. James Bond's got to look like a lethal killer. Yeah. A ruthless man who will get rid of enemies of the state. Sorry, Roger not, Moore. Not some... Oh, yeah. Roger, Moore. Oh, Roger Moore was Mr. the best. Mr Beige. Roger Moore was the best. But don't you think that Cubby Broccoli was just attracted to the idea of somebody who grows kale? And there's, there's a link there. Oh, yeah. boom, boom. Uh, <laughs> move on, move oh, very on. good. Very good before, indeed. Before we, who yeah. would you, Stephen, if you were choosing the next James Bond, who would you cast? Aidan Turner. Right. Uh, who was, of course, uh, Mr. D who was... He was um, uh, Poldark. Poldark. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, James Norton. I think oh, he's great. I, like I think he's fantastic. And he's got that sort of well, English charm. He's got well. the English charm. He yeah, looks like an English gentleman. Yeah. He's played so many different parts, from a vicar in yeah. Cambridgeshire to a ruthless killer in uh, Yorkshire, you know yeah, what I mean? He also, he also yeah. played in um, The Scandal about... Um, he was the... The female affair. The female yeah. affair, the osteopath. He played yeah. the osteopath. Dr oh, Stephen yeah, Ward. Yes, yes, Stephen Ward. He's Dr yeah. Stephen Ward. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, right. and he was in the, uh, the Macafia one as yeah. well, wasn't he? He was a ruthless gangster villain great. in Macafia. Yeah. I, I'm, quite, I'm quite relieved it's not a woman, because you remember all that talk well, about having, a lot of talk having it Jane Bond. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. shush. Right, still to come. Did you say shush? Yes. Shush. Yeah. Really got to move on. Could comedians be targeted under new SNP hate crime laws? And is this the end of free Speech. What a joke. Here with Britain's Newsroom on GB News. Headliners. Tomorrow's papers tonight. Every night from 11pm. Welcome back to Headliners. And, Paul, we're going to get straight into Monday's mail for some good old-fashioned, traditional mail breastfeeding. Yeah. Uh, to answer the question, what is the latest woke hell, Josh? Uh, Row as hospitals say, hormone-filled milk from trans <laughs> women who were born male is just as good for a baby as the real thing. It's possible 
for men, if they pump themselves full of oestrogen, to grow larger breast tissue. And they often do... If or you just eat lots of burgers. Uh, yeah, or... Yeah. <laughs> Easy bit, eh? Um, but... And once you've done that, it is, it is actually then possible to express or lactate some... A liquid. A liquid, OK? If to that liquid you then add another load of pills, medication, chemicals, whatever, that lactation juice can be fed to a baby. We don't really... This is not for the sake of the baby. The baby has no benefits from this whatsoever. The studies are very weak on it. Um, it's a bit worrying because... You know, when hospitals started indulging in, in homeopathy and having, a, you know, the NHS had homeo homeopathic um, hospitals, that was worrying because they're supposed to be a trusted authority. And before saying something like this, there should be an awful lot of study done. And I want to show you this hostel. This is whether it's necessary. The University yeah, let's Hostel do. Sussex NHS Foundation Trust. That's who it is. And they have written one of the stupidest sentences I have read God, Josh, aloud read in the two years that I've been <laughs> privileged to do this show. It says, the term human milk is meant to be neutral and not gender biased. <laughs> Yep. Wow. Yep. That's incredible. Yep. Oh, my God, we're laughing at you. I mean, and as someone says here, babies are not props. And that's the yep. scary thing. And no. when it's not... When we're not focusing primarily on the health of a baby... No, but the, uh, the, the, the feeling of a person doing it, yeah. rather than... It's, it's a bit of an odd way to go, isn't it? So... From 10am every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Still to come, Scotland comedy under threat. Now, though, let's get your latest news headlines. It's Fo Winter. Thanks, Andrew. It's 11.32. I'm Sophia Wensler in the GB Newsroom. UK inflation has fallen more than expected to the lowest level in over two years. Official figures show UK inflation for February came in at 3.4%. That's down from 4%. Economists had forecasts the Office for National Statistics figure would fall to 3.5%. Inflation is now closer to the Bank of England's 2% target. Housing asylum seekers on barges, military bases and student digs will cost taxpayers more than the hotels currently being used. The National Audit Office said housing those waiting for asylum decisions in alternative accommodation, such as the BBC Stockholm Barge and former RAF sites, would cost the Home Office £1.2 billion. That's £46 million more than using hotels and B&Bs. And at least eight dinghies carrying migrants have been reported in the Channel this morning. UK and French authorities are responding and 92 people have already been counted by GB News, disembarking from a border force boat in Dover. It's thought good weather conditions have caused the surge and takes the number of asylum seekers who've arrived by small boats this year to over 3,600. Time's running out for Rishi Sunak, the message from Ed Davey as he launches the Liberal Democrats' local elections campaign. The Lib Dem leader kicked off his party's English local elections campaign in Blue Wall, Hertfordshire, where the Lib Dems made major gains last year. Ed Davey revealed his message to the Prime Minister as he unveiled a blue and gold hourglass in front of Lib Dem activists. Time is running out for Rishi Sunak. He might have bottled the May election. He might be hoping the tide will turn as he squats in Downing Street for a few months more. But even the Prime Minister can't deny voters across England the chance to cast their vote in the local elections on May the 2nd. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts.
for exclusive, limited edition and rare gold coins that are always newsworthy. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.2696 and €1.1709. The price of gold is £1,695.89 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,722 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Eleven thirty-five with Britain's News and GB News with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner. So comedians could be penalised by SNP's hate crime crackdown after police officers were told in leaked training materials that their performances could be used to broadcast abusive material. Well, joining us now is Scottish comedian and GB News presenter who you'll know so well, Leo Kirst. Leo, good morning to you. Um, uh, we think you're very funny, and I'm sorry the SNP have had a sense of humour bypass, but can you explain exactly what the SNP have done and why it could impact on people like you? So they've passed this uh, this hate crime act, which uh, basically criminalises, it extends the reach of uh, of hate crime laws uh, into the privacy of your own home. You know, previously you had a, a sort of um, a, a privacy uh, get out clause. That's where the you know the reach of the government didn't come into private conversations in your own home. And it also extends onto the stage. They've uh, they've literally had the police have a training uh, that says that hate crime could occur on stage as part of a play uh, or or a performance, which I mean that's that's terrifying. Are they gonna are they gonna go in and into the pantomime and arrest the ugly sisters for what they did to Cinderella? It's uh, it's an absolute nonsense. The whole the whole thing is based on perception as well. So uh, there doesn't need to be a victim. Uh, there doesn't need to be any evidence of a of a crime or or anything like that. There just needs to be the perception. They they sort of elevate the perception in a in a witness's mind. So I mean it's just open to abuse. The whole thing is really badly worded. It's really vague worded so anybody uh, can can make vexatious uh, accusations against other people and the police say they're going to prioritize they're going to prioritize uh, hate crime uh, over they're going to investigate every single report bear in mind they've decided to stop investigating actual real crime low-level crime uh, including some thefts um, so so it's 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 going to be an absolute absolute bun fight. It's a it's a nonsensical law, and the the police. I mean, it's a difficult law for the police mm. to enforce um, because uh, it doesn't make common sense. So uh, so yeah, it's good. I mean, previously I did a show in Glasgow. Um, this is before the the law came through, but the the atmosphere is is so sort of febrile, and people are so sensitive now. The the venue cancelled the show, and then would only allow it to go ahead uh, with stewards standing either side of the stage uh, to make sure I didn't commit a hate crime, wow. which is, in, that's like something in Iran or, uh, or uh, you know, that, that's like some Lenny Bruce went Leo, through. Leo, um, Hamza Youssef is really excited about this. He thinks this is great news, doesn't he? Um, do you th how has it been able to creep upon us, mm. this authoritarian political landscape that we're now living in. The government should be afraid of its people. It, the people should not be afraid of the government. How has it happened? Uh, well, it's happened because, um, I mean, basically they sell it to us by saying, oh, this is this is to keep you safe. You know, this is to make sure, you know, if you if you hear any any hurtful words or offensive phrases, we can keep you safe from that. But in reality, the, the government is just going to use it to, to control public discourse and to persecute political distance and persecute its enemies. So, for example, Marion Miller, who's a gender critical feminist who criticised the SNP's gender ideology, criticised the idea that, uh, you know, biological males uh, who've been convicted of rape should be allowed to, to go into women's prisons, which is obviously, you know, I mean, uh, common sense would say, don't put a male rapist in a women's women's prison. That's that's not a punishment. That's mm. that's something he's going to enjoy. Uh, and and the idea of uh, you know transitioning children and breaking that bond between parents and uh, and and the, and the child. So she criticised all that. Uh, she tweeted a picture of a suffragette ribbon, and somebody complained that that was a transphobic hate crime because it could be perceived as a noose 
abuse. Therefore, it was a call to violence, which is obviously nonsensical. Yeah. It's just a picture of a suffragette ribbon. But she was she was uh, arrested and uh, and charged. The, the case was luckily thrown out of court. Mm. Uh, but in cases like this, the the process is the punishment. You know, she's frog marched down to the station. Her children are upset. Uh, you know, she's she's. The, the, I spoke to a journalist who said, you know, she was flanked by the biggest, burliest officers. The whole thing was done to intimidate her. So yeah, the, this this law will just be applied selectively to critics of the SNP. Has the, I'm just imagine what, what of the SNP government have they not realised that this has gone too far, or perhaps, Leo, this is what they intended? Well, yeah, I mean, Scotland because it's a small country, because it's a devolved. Parliament, it, uh, it operates in a, in a bit of a vacuum. It doesn't have the, the oversight that, um, that a, a parliament such as Westminster has. And it's it's surrounded by NGOs and special interest groups that, uh, that advise it. Um, and so I think it's become a, a bit divorced from what the Scottish people actually want and what the Scottish people actually believe in. The Scottish mm. people are surprisingly conservative. Um, so, um, mm. yeah, I think, I think these NGOs have sort of steered it, steered it in a, in a certain, certain direction. It's also, I'm slightly amused by the juxtaposition of such an authoritarian government and some of the most outspoken, fearless comedians in the world being Scottish. Didn't they pick the wrong bunch? Won't comedians just push back and do the polar opposite of what they're expected to do? Well, maybe, but I mean, a, a lot of comedians in Scotland see this as a as a great thing because you know people shouldn't be offended. Scotland, Scotland's really changed. Uh, I mean, Frankie, look at Frankie Boyle, for example. You know, yeah. 15 years ago he was cracking outrageous, hilarious jokes. Now he's become part of the regime, uh, just repeating the mantra of the progressive left. Uh, and and pretty soon, I mean, we've had incredible iconoclastic comedians in Scotland, such as Billy Connolly, Jerry yeah. Sadowitz, that have really pushed yeah. boundaries. But pretty soon, you won't even be able to say, you know, why did the chicken cross the road because that'll offend a vegan <laughs> <laughs> well we're laughing but it's bleak leo yeah, I, I, for one i i'm really worried about it i i despise it it will still come for the comedians first and then it will just be all of us with any sort of public voice uh, thank you yep. so much leo curse we have, uh, raising awareness it's really important we do have to read a reply from the statement from police scotland who say police scotland is not instructing officers to target actors comedians or any other people or groups the training material was based on the scottish government's explanatory notes which accompany the legislation they go on this included examples of a range of scenarios where offenses might take place but this does not mean officers have been told to target these situations oh that's okay then so that means yeah. that the officers can exercise their own free yeah. will well they and, and, and they did, and that woman was arrested over a, a, an image of a suffragette, an important part of British history. Honestly, anyway. Still to come. He fasts for 36 hours at the start of each week. That's our Prime Minister. How safe is fasting? A new study has some rather shocking results. Stay tuned. Good morning. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Bit of a drab start for most of us today. Dull and damp. The brightest skies are going to be across Northern Ireland and Western Scotland, where we should see some lengthy spells of sunshine. Elsewhere, sunshine in short supply. Generally dry and fine across the southeast. It may cheer up here, but a damp start for eastern Scotland, southern Scotland. The rain will tend to ease here through the day, but it stays uh, pretty dank across northern England, particularly Yorkshire, parts of North Wales. The rain on and off, but fairly low. Light. To the south of that, mostly dry and still pretty mild. 18 Celsius is possible with a bit of sunshine. Some sunnier skies across the northwest. A, a cooler day here with a, a fresher feel in the cooler air, but still plenty of sunshine, feeling pleasant enough. The rain and drizzle will trickle away from eastern parts of England through this evening. Much of uh, the UK will become dry by midnight. But then after midnight, more rain comes into the far northwest. The wind's picking up here as well. Quite a bit of cloud around. Could see some mist and fog where we keep some clearer skies. Temperatures may in rural spots get close to freezing. On to Thursday then, and generally a dry, fine day for England and Wales. A brighter day, certainly to the east of the Pennines compared to today. Still a fair bit of cloud elsewhere, but some bright or sunny spells in the south. Outbreaks of rain will move in across Scotland and Northern Ireland through the day, so a, a blustery and a fairly wet day here. Rain on and off throughout. Again, fairly mild for most of us, with temperatures generally in the teens.
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Let's see what you've been saying at home. It was the front page of Telegraph today that HMRC were to shut their phone lines, uh, helplines, uh, for six months. Well... Not a summer break, as said. We talked about it here, and yeah. guess what's happened? I think you at home might have changed their mind. HMRC are not now going to close their phone lines uh, for six months. Let's see what you said at home, which might have helped make this decision happen. George has said, um, oh, no, race from Middleton on Sea says, I think the above is endorsed by government as official policy to delay us receiving tax refunds that are due to us now and assist in triggering penalties, uh, both to boost government cash flow. Actually, I take it, I think, actually, Ray, actually, I think Jeremy Hunt has been out and about doing media rounds there. I think ministers would have seen this story with horror because yeah. it fits into the whole narrative. Nothing works in this country, whether it's trains, the M25 being closed, HMRC to shut phone out for six months, half a year. I think the ministers have gone on the phone and said, you can unpick that decision a bit fast, and they have. And well, so they should. They have, as we just said, breaking news, they've reversed this decision to close the self-assessment telephone helpline for half of the year. This is the HMRC. The tax authority announced yesterday that it will be closed between April and September with taxpayers directed to use the services online. Today, they've now said... It ain't happening. They're going to keep it open Look all that. summer. It's pressure, and pressure can sometimes do the trick. I'm convinced that's what's happened. Yeah. They've had the reaction. And it was they've bad. They've heard people like us. I'm sure... You know, we know they have it on in 10 downing. They do. Anyway. They do. Um, so they've clearly made the right decision. And Good, that doesn't very I often. I text the Chancellor from time to time. Oh, look I at you dropping... <laughs> well, I've known him since he was a back... Jeremy Hunt? MP. Yeah. Oh, I've got a few messages I could it, get you it, to send it, to him. It, uh, let me tell you, he won't be an MP after the next general election because he's going to lose his seat. Hmm. I think he'll be fine. He won't. Well, no, not no, in no. the election, but he'll go on to be his... Oh, yeah, he'll do fine. Well, he'll go to House of Lords. Right. Intermittent fasting. It's a dieting trend endorsed by celebrities from Kim Kardashian to Rishi Sunak. New research says it might actually be damaging to long-term health as those who eat only during eight hours of the day are twice at risk of a heart attack I wonder what that means stroke. for people who do Ramadan. Well, let's find out. We're joined now by award-winning nutritionist Rob Hobson, who can tell us more. Hi. Good morning, Rob. You know what? When we have these um, these health measures that seem to be doing people a lot of good, and there seems to be a good amount of evidence to say that fasting gives your organs a rest, can help reset your metabolism. I was just waiting for the piece of research to come along and tell us it was a bad idea. Is it genuine? Yeah, I mean, this is the problem, isn't it, with all this stuff? It just confuses people. So yeah. it is genuine. Well. The research findings show what they show, but actually, if you dig a bit deeper, it's not the full story. So what they looked at was intermittent fasting, as you say, that, that eight, only eating for eight hours, and they did find a really higher risk of, of chronic disease, cardiovascular disease. But also, they didn't look at the uh, dietary intake of the people involved. And obviously, if you, you know, the nutritional quality of their diets, if you eat a poor diet within that winter, then you are also going to be at increased risk of cardiovascular disease. They also only looked at the, they only also established that time window of eating by looking at two days um, of eating patterns. And this research was looking at 
eight years up to 17 years of, of observation. So, you know, that's not really reflective of somebody's diet probably over that time period. And it is an observational study, so it doesn't prove cause and effect. So mm. before people start panicking that they've been on an intermittent fasting diet and they're going to die of heart disease, it's not quite the case. It's not the full story. Well, well what do you make of the Prime Minister's diet? Because we do know he does this every week, Thursday night, Sunday night, 5 o'clock, that's it, no food for 36 hours. And he's taking some pretty yeah. big decisions during that time. Yeah, it's pretty hardcore, isn't it? I mean, that is for yeah, that is for the hardcore faster. I wouldn't recommend it for people that don't know how to fast. There are issues around that. You can feel lightheaded. Um, it can be hard to concentrate. You may um, put yourself at risk of not getting the right nutrients from your diet because of this prolonged period of fasting. And obviously, hydration as well is really important. So I think if it works for him, fine, but it's not something I would recommend to everybody. It's at the very extreme end of fasting. Mm. Seems to be all sorts mm. of reasons why people are having heart attacks in the last couple of years, doesn't there? We've seen all sorts of wild theories out there, but while we've got you, Rob, how do you look after your mm. heart health? What would your suggestions be? So it's very simple. I would follow the Mediterranean style of eating. This is lean proteins, foods that are high in fibre, and fibre is very cardioprotective. It helps to lower blood cholesterol levels, lower blood pressure, and has many other health benefits. Um, I'd avoid having too much saturated fat in your diet, so go for um, low dairy products, try and avoid a lot of these ultra-processed foods, pies, pastries, sweets, puddings. It's kind of common sense, really. It's just trying to put all of that into action. And obviously, if you can eat mostly fresh, most of the time, uh, mm. do your best to try and do it, and that, that's a great step forward as well. And get walking, Rob Hobson, I always get say. Walking. Get moving. That's Keep the active, best thing for definitely. Your heart. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Um, good to see you. Pleasure. Now, so Keir Starmer is taking on Rishi Sunak. It's PMQs. It's Wednesday, of course, um, with all... Uh, we've got all the build-up in just a moment. Uh, this is Britain's Newsroom. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Today we've got some rain spilling its way south and eastwards, the best of the brightness up towards the northwest and fairly mild across the country. Now that's down to this weather front that we've got sitting through central parts of the country, bringing this mild air across the UK. But as it eases from the northwest, you can see some brighter skies pushing in to western Scotland and Northern Ireland through this afternoon. So that's where we'll see the best of the sunshine. Quite grey, quite murky and cloudy with rain and drizzle, some heavier bursts through the day across England and Wales, but down towards the southeast, it should stay dry or we'll see some brightness with highs of 16 or 17 Celsius. Through Wednesday evening then, that rain continues to filter its way south and eastwards, tending to die out as it does through the night. A lot of cloud left in its wake, though some pockets of mist and fog developing and a few clear spells, particularly for the north and the northwest. But later in the night, you can see this cloud and rain gathering across western Scotland and Northern Ireland, so turning quite wet and windy by the end of the night. But typically temperatures around where they should be for this time of year, a generally mild night. Wet and windy start to the day, though, for Scotland and Northern Ireland. That rain continuing to pile in through the day. The wind's picking up across the country, turning quite windy in the far northwest. But a breezy picture elsewhere, bright and breezy for England and Wales. Some sunny spells from time to time, just making it feel a little fresher than today. But still highs of 15 or 16. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, 
Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Well, we're now going live to Westminster to Gloria De Piero and Christopher Hope for Primes' questions live. Yes, it's that time of the week when we 